my base case has the U.S. economy slowing, flirting with a recession. We think at a minimum, Fed funds gets to four and three quarters, five percent. The Fed needs to see more to say we can decelerate then from 50 down to 25 and ultimately pause at some point. There is no Fed right. member that wants to go down in history as losing the fight on inflation. We might actually have a scenario where we could have a soft landing because we are now seeing inflation begin to come down. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Here we go again, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Rabbits, I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK is going to be back in a couple of days' time. And the equity market, we're down four tenths of 1%. Happening right now, a meeting between the President of the United States and President Xi. Yeah, talking about the red lines and figuring out where they are and what they can do. Is this a Xi Jinping that is more conciliatory with respect to uh, creating a better relationship with the U.S., given some of the moves overnight, or not? Or we're really going to take a hard line and create a bit more uh, of, of tension going forward. We're looking for a news conference from the president that should commence around 8.30 Eastern time. So that's two hours and 30 minutes from now. Also need to talk about the outlooks. Finally, someone had the courage to press send, enter, go on the Bloomberg. The outlook for 2023 is so difficult to publish anything right now. The year of yield. That is Andrew Sheets, he, Morgan Stanley. He was the brave one that you just said that pressed the button. And I will just say uh, that I took off on Friday and the market managed to rally tremendously. So there you go. I should take off and, and I guess that uh, let everything go. How much are we talking about peak dollar? Morgan Stanley was talking about that. We also saw that from Deutsche Bank. George Cervello is talking about peak dollar. And how much are we talking about ongoing yield and the search for yield and people going into some of the bonds that were most beaten up this year? Mike Wilson talked about a volatile path to 3,900. Yeah. 3,900 is basically where we are right now. He's looking for huge downside in the first quarter to discount the earnings risk for the year ahead, then ultimately to rally from there quite aggressively into year end. But from point to point, year end 2023 to year end, which is where we are right now, he's basically looking for a flat market on the S&P. Under the surface, what does that mean? What does that mean with tech leadership? What does that mean with small caps? How much do small caps keep getting a boost given that the dollar is expected to peak out? How much do you see a rotation into energy given how much you've already seen the outperformance year to date? These are some of the questions that really uh, the calm of a stasis belie. So-called bear market rally. Can it continue? Your equity market right now down four-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Coming off the back of the biggest week of gains on the S&P since June on the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ 100 last week up almost 9%. Biggest week of gains going back to November 2020. The Treasury market reopens. Yields are higher by seven basis points. We'll talk about the Governor Wallet pushback in just a moment. Your 10-year, 388.18. And Bramo, some dollar strength coming back after a week of dollar weakness. Euro dollar 102.93. We're down a half of 1%. So and I'm sure that you read the same notes that I did about peak dollar and that sure. we've already seen it. How much do you actually think that there was credence behind the moves that we saw, given the bond market was closed on Friday, given some of the lack of liquidity in some of these markets and that there has been so much chop? I mean, do you buy this idea that we saw some sort of peaking out and that there is something substantive behind uh, the incredible weakening that we saw over the past couple of sessions? It comes down to CPI, downside surprise. That's what sparked it. You've got to ask yourself, OK, do we continue falling in the right direction? I think most people assume we do. At what pace? Still unknown. To what destination? I have no idea. And how much damage do we do in the economy in between? The global economy, for that matter, not just the US. And they're all the questions you've got to ask to come to any kind of conclusion as to whether this continues. And if you think I've got the answers, <laughs> I don't have the answers. That's why well, I'm sitting here and we book the good guests to go through those kind of things. And as you've hinted at, a lot of people have not come out with their uh, outlooks for next year because perhaps nobody really has that crystal ball except for Mike Wilson at Morgan Stanley. All right, so today, 8.30 a.m., that is the expected around about time. Uh, President Biden will be giving a speech and taking questions from Bali, Indonesia, after his meeting with Xi Jinping. How much do we get a sense of what those red lines are? How much do we get a sense of how much Xi Jinping is trying to lure American business back? There was an article over the weekend that I thought was interesting about how banks were retrenching from China quietly, also seeing how much BlackRock is closing the bond ETF. Today, we also hear from Fed Vice Chair Lael Brainerd, uh, who's going to be joining Bloomberg's Peggy Collins for a discussion. How much does she reiterate what we heard from Chris Waller? Also, at 8, 6.30 uh, p.m. tonight, Fed President John Williams is talking uh, with a uh, with a discussion at the New York Economic Club. And then this evening, the Bloomberg New Economy Forum kicking off in Singapore. Uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, former U.S. Secretary of State and National Security, 
Security Advisor Catherine Tai, U.S. Trade Representative among the first speakers. I'm particularly interested to hear what Catherine Tai has to say, John. Looking forward to that. It's going to be a big event a little bit later through the week. Let's start with Laurie Calvacina, Head of U.S. Equity Strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Laurie, Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley talking about the volatile path back to 3,900 after maybe testing something like 3K in the first quarter. Laurie, earnings risk. Can you walk us through where you see the earnings risk in the economy right now for corporate America and where you expect that to land? Sure. It's a great question, John. And let me let me say, look, I don't think we're out of the woods on earnings yet. That being said, I do think it's possible that markets put in the ultimate low in October because three to six months before uh, you get the final earnings downgrades is typically when the stock market bottoms in big sort of challenge periods. But just kind of backing up from that, I think we're at 208 for next year on earnings. I think the consensus is still tracking around, say, 232, 233. Um, you know, what we really have baked in is moderating inflation, which is really tanking our revenue number. It doesn't really end up helping margins. We find that margins are really more of a function of wages, where we've still got some wage growth baked in on um, things like productivity, pricing. I think as inflation moderates, that hurts pricing power as well. So we've really got a ratcheting down of earnings and kind of, you know, flattish to slightly down levels with what we saw last year in the S&P 500. This is very similar in our minds to the 2015-2016 backdrop where we just kind of don't really go anywhere on earnings for a few years. Um, but I think, honestly, John, I don't think the street really has a good understanding of how much moderating inflation is going to hurt earnings because of that link to revenues. How much are we going to see the leadership change, Lori, in a sustainable way over the next year? So I think this is a great question, Lisa, and I think this is probably, you know, one of the, the bigger challenges to figure out for next year, frankly. Typically, when you are in a sluggish economic growth backdrop, growth stocks outperform. So that would point you to things like technology, communication services, consumer discretionary. And one of the things our economists have been talking about is that if you, when you kind of get out of this short, shallow recession, we're going to see pretty sluggish GDP for a while. I do think, though, that there's a big leadership change afoot here. So I'd be very, very selective in looking at some of those growthy parts of the market. We like tech, but we don't like the others. If you think, though, about kind of the value-oriented sectors, we're starting to hear some people make a growth case for them, things like energy, things like industrials, and you're starting to see some pretty good outperformance in sectors like that over the past month or so. Frankly, energy's been doing great all year, but now we're starting to see that broaden out to some of the other value-oriented sectors. So I would say stay pretty balanced, have a little bit of growth, have some value exposure. I think that's going to work better in the near term anyway. Be balanced and try to be more selective within those buckets as opposed to just leaning into one big bucket for the longer term. Laura, you brought up something about how you are leaning into big tech potentially. And this is one of the big questions over the past week with the tremendous rally. Does it have legs? Can it reassert itself? Are you really in the camp that it can? In terms of the rally, you know, look, I, I would say I probably share Wilson's view that we're going to be volatile for a bit longer. Um, one of the things we pointed out is that markets in 2022 are really trading on the 2002 path. Um, and if you look at, you know, sort of what happened back then, we had a, a January peak, a summer low, a big October low. We rallied back pretty fiercely into Thanksgiving. And then we turned around and gave most of it back going into a new low in March. And so on the one hand, I do see the potential for the rally to continue a little bit in the longer term. I think, frankly, on things like the election, that's already baked in. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people who think the Fed moves have been exaggerated. We can save that for another segment. Um, but I, I do think that we're going to chop around. And I think, you know, whether or not you think the rally can continue, sure, I think it can continue a bit in the short term. But I do think there's a tremendous risk that we do give a lot of it back in the first quarter. We won't save it for another segment. You can't bring up the Fed and not talk about the Fed, Laurie. <laughs> Let's talk about it now. Jenna Smilik of the New York Times yesterday was live blogging Governor Waller's speech down in Australia. And this is what Governor Waller had to say. The market seems to have gotten way out in front. We're going to need to see a continued run of this kind of behaviour before we really start to think about taking our foot off the break. Laurie, is the Fed still in charge of where this market goes and how far this rally can go to the upside? Well, look, I think I think it was really interesting. You know, we said in our weekly, John, that, you know, we liked what we saw in the CPI print. But the thing we didn't like is we knew the Fed was going to come out and quite quash it with harsh rhetoric. And that's exactly what we ended up getting with Waller. Um, and look, I think that, you know, to some extent, maybe they are losing a little bit of control. Um, I think that they are trying their best to clamp down on the enthusiasm. But I'll tell you, John, I don't think the peak inflation, peak Fed narrative ever really went away. I think that those people just got really, really quiet over the last month or so because they were tired of having their heads ripped off. Well, they're loud now. So I think when we... 
Yeah, they're loud now because when we saw that CPI print came out, there was a massive sigh of relief. There was a massive sort of uncoiling of enthusiasm. And I sympathize with those who say the market went too far, but at the same time, having talked to a lot of investors that you know had been doing work on used car prices and other all the all these other components of inflation coming down, you know, I understand the release that happened. I understand that relief valve that occurred. Laurie, final question. What are you telling clients about what's happening in crypto and what it means for them, even if they're not in the asset class? Yeah, so it, it's a great question, John. You know, I don't cover it. Um, we, we sort of leave that to other people at the firm. But one of the things we have talked about is the extent to which the average retail investor, you know, is involved. And I know I saw a Good Morning Consult poll recently that said about 19% of those that they surveyed owned crypto, um, you know, which tells me that uh, perhaps it's not as pervasive as some fear in terms of the impact to the average investor. We're going to have to see. We're getting a lot of information right now. But as I've talked to some of my friends sort of in the wealth management community, remember, I speak mostly with institutions, but as I've talked to some of my friends in the wealth management community over the past year or so, you know, I've heard things like, well, my clients aren't really involved in crypto. Their kids and grandkids have tried to get them involved, um, but they've said no. So, you know, for the moment, I still view this as a contained implosion, but we do have to watch it. There's a tremendous correlation between the S&P and Bitcoin, and we do view Bitcoin as a risk barometer for stocks. Stocks have been sort of defined the carnage that we've seen in that space recently, but we'll have to keep an eye and, you know, frankly, just, just see how bad this is. It's something we've got to watch. Laurie, brilliant to catch up as always. Let's talk before year end. Laurie Calvacini there of RBC Capital Markets. Bramo, do you think the Thanksgiving conversations will be a little bit different? around the crypto story. Do you think it's the grandparents telling the kids now what's what, as opposed to the kids telling the grandparents? I suspect it won't get brought, in, brought up too much, or perhaps it will with a bit of tongue-in-cheek, a bit of a, huh, how do you think about that now? But at what point does it really have a broader uh, effect, and at what point would we really be talking about this at all if it weren't for free money that could have pumped it up to start with? And Governor Waller has some advice for everybody. Everybody should just take a deep breath, calm down. We have a ways to go <laughs> yet. Governor Waller speaking in Australia yesterday evening coming up at seven o'clock in the next hour Priya Misra the head of global rate strategy at TD Securities equity futures down four tenths of one percent live from New York with Lisa Tom Keen away I'm Jonathan Farrow this is Bloomberg Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, President Biden and China's Xi Jinping are having their first ever in-person meeting. They shook hands before sitting down at a hotel in Bali, Indonesia. The city is the site of the Group of 20 summit. The president told Xi the two have a responsibility to show that China and the U.S. can prevent competition from turning into conflict. In Turkey, authorities say Kurdish militant group PKK and its U.S.-backed affiliates in Syria were behind a deadly bomb attack in Istanbul. The explosion killed at least six people and wounded 81 in the city's tourist district. Turkey says the suspect has been captured and identified her as a Syrian national. In the U.K., Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt is expected to delay much of the $65 billion spending cuts and tax hikes until after the next election. That would both protect the economy and shore up support for the Conservative Party as the country heads into recession. Bloomberg's learned the bulk of the savings would be delivered in the final years of the five-year forecast. Rochez, a long-awaited experimental drug for Alzheimer's disease, failed in a pair of large studies. The drug didn't slow clinical decline in people with early Alzheimer's. It's another disappointment in research field that's been marred with failures. And shares of Japan's SoftBank have plunged today. The company failed to announce a widely expected stock buyback. Plus, SoftBank's core vision fund posted a $7.2 billion loss in the July through September quarter. Sliding startup valuations have forced the world's biggest technology investor to go into defensive mode and virtually halt investments. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Let's get you a flavor of the price action this morning. Equity futures are down four-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. The pushback coming from Governor Waller as we get the training week underway. And Governor Waller sending yields much higher, twos out to tens. Governor Waller saying, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath, Bramo. <laughs> 
He feels like there's a risk of July all over again, the premature easing of financial conditions off the back of one major downside surprise on CPI. This goes back to a question you've asked repeatedly. How much will the Federal Reserve allow this market to rally? How much is there sort of a Fed cap on how far stocks can go? And is that basically what uh, Fed Governor Chris Waller is saying? Hey, guys, uh uh-uh, we don't like this, so we're going to jawbone this down, and we're going to keep raising rates until you stop it. His language wasn't a million miles away from what you just said. (laughs) No, it was actually quite similar. It was pretty informal, pretty direct, and I imagine... More Fed speakers this week will say the same thing. They don't want to signal they're going to back away anytime soon. But if you're in the market right now, you're not in the business of working out what they're going to signal, what they're not going to signal. It's what they're going to do and where inflation is going to land. And people believe that's the start of a trend back down towards trajectory. How much are they grasping towards at Towards target, rather. I mean, did you actually dig under the data and see some of the, uh, for example, the healthcare price crash that people were looking at and they were saying it could be technical? I mean, there are reasons why people might say it's perhaps overly stating the deceleration. And the Fed is very worried about getting over their skis with saying, OK, we've reached it, hallelujah. A peak is in, let's go to some kind of weakening trajectory and then go back to the 1970s. Now that's the Fed conversation dealt with. <laughs> let's deal with the G20. Are we done? <laughs> We're not done. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> On the sidelines of the G20, before that gets underway, President Xi and President Biden meeting, shaking hands. Apparently, that's a headline. No fist bump this time around. Woo. This is what the president had to say. We share responsibility, in my view to show that China and the United States can manage our differences. On the ground, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie joins us right now. AMH, what's top of mind as this meeting is ongoing and is set to conclude in the next couple of hours? The president will speak at 8.30 Eastern time. Yeah, that's right, Jonathan, waiting for it to wrap up and what the president has to say to reporters about this meeting, because there won't be a joint statement. There really are no deliverables or announcements that these two countries are going to make out of this meeting. What we have heard from officials is that they want to set the floor on how they deal with Beijing and really setting the guardrails. Three of the biggest issues that are likely going to come up and the most contentious are going to be Putin's war and invasion of Ukraine. Of course, we know that Xi Jinping, his only really friendly ally on the big international stage, is Xi Jinping. And they met in Uzbekistan. And Putin even said to Xi, we know you have some questions and concerns. The second, of course, would be is what's going on in the technology and chip chip sector. We have the Commerce Department with these sweeping curbs that China really needs this technology. This is something that has drawn the ear of Beijing. And then finally, and the most contentious is going to be, of course, the Taiwan Strait. And this really came to the forefront this summer when Speaker Pelosi made that visit to Taiwan. Beijing came out cutting off ties with the United States on a number of fronts when it came to communication and conducting military drills. This, for Xi Jinping, is really a red line. And we want to see what the president has to say, because as you know, there has been a number of occasions where he said the U.S. would defend Taiwan. Some people might call this the appetizer for the G20. I think it's in reverse. This is the main event. Amory, if there are no deliverables available for either leader going into this meeting, can we get a communique at the G20? It's a great question, Jonathan. We're just off the heels of a multinational summit in Cambodia, and there was no G20 communique. And that is because Russia said they could not sign their name into something in terms of the language that the, they say the United States was pressuring other countries to sign. Clearly, that language would have been regarding the war in Ukraine calling it Putin's invasion of Ukraine, actually calling it a war. This is something Russia will not be able to sign up to. They continue to say this is a, quote, special military operation. So you can see the divergence we are seeing amongst countries. And it really puts countries like India, like China, in very difficult positions. Because at the same time, they want to maintain good relations with Russia, even though A U.S. official said it to us. There is probably some embarrassment in Beijing about what is going on in terms of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And, Ray, coming into this G20 meeting, uh, President Biden actually gained his Senate back from the brink of a lot of rumors. People think there was going to be a red wave. There wasn't. How much more energy does that really give him or more of a mandate to go out there and pursue an agenda that is his? And what does that mean? What is he going to do with that? 
Biden said yesterday in Cambodia he feels strong going into this summit because of the fact the Democrats were able to retain control of the Senate. And Tina Fordham said it on this program last week. She said she thinks Biden is going to be walking into this Xi Jinping meeting with a bit of swag in his step because of the fact that it wasn't a red wave. This just gives Biden and his team more momentum to pursue this agenda abroad, especially when it comes to foreign policy. But we've talked about this a lot. When it comes to China in Washington, there is bipartisan support to take a more hawkish approach. And you are seeing that now with this administration. We should also note over the weekend, they really were shoring up what the allies, their allies, think of what's going on with China. Most notably, Australia, Japan, South Korea. And one notable aspect they wanted, it seemed, President Biden to bring to the table was really in terms of North Korea. And it seems pretty clear that the United States is going to say to Xi Jinping, you either reign in North Korea or expect a broader U.S. military presence in the Asia Pacific. I'm not going to pretend anyone at the G20 has any swag. I don't know about you, Bremer. <laughs> You think any of those leaders have got swagger? I'm going to let you wait on that. I don't know about that. Go ahead. Well, I just did. <laughs> Good. Just I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you, Anne-Marie. Wonderful, as always. To your point, you were both talking about it. Certainly both leaders right now emboldened by domestic events. One democratic, the other not so much. But that's really the story over the last couple of weeks. How much, though, is Xi Jinping truly emboldened based on an economy flat on its back? And you can see that with some of the easing measures overnight. How much does he feel an urgency of putting the economy as more of a priority than, say, uh, what he said in his speech at the Chinese Party Congress? I wonder this especially. Did you see Olaf Scholz coming out and warning German businesses that the time is now to diversify away from China? Can you make sense of that for me, based on Chancellor Scholz's recent visit to Beijing alongside corporate Germany. Can you make sense of that for me? Because I don't understand those comments. So I'll bring this to you. I can't, but I'll bring this to you. Basically, sure. uh, avoiding over-reliance on China, in particular in certain areas. He called for areas including raw materials and critical technologies, where he wanted to see a scaling back of risky one-sided dependencies, trying to avoid a redux of what happened in Russia. To your point, how does that cohere with the meeting that they just had over in China? Do you think that's a message for the German companies or for for America, American leadership, that we're on the same page, we're going to do yeah. what you need us to do. Well, and it's interesting that this is coming at the same time as President Biden meets with Xi Jinping. How much is that exactly playing lip service to what the U.S. is trying to do? But how much do businesses move in the other way? We've been talking about this for a while. So much swagger at the G20. <laughs> <laughs> Define swagger. AMH has got swagger. Handshakes. AMH. Fist bumps is that swag. <laughs> well, she's going to show us uh, some swagger later on. Equity futures down four tens from New York. This is Bloomberg. Coming off the back of the biggest week of gains on the S&P 500 since June. This is the price action this Monday morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures are negative, have been negative throughout most of this morning, down about four-tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down seven-tenths of 1%. On the Nasdaq last week, biggest week of gains since November 2020. In the bond market, twos, tens and thirties look like this. The two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year took Friday off. But the two-year over the previous four days, Monday through Thursday, was down 33 basis points on the week. Right now, 4.38. Yields a bit higher up, five basis points off the back of Governor Wallace's comments yesterday evening in Australia. Basically, take a deep breath. We've got a long, long way to go. Outside of the bond market in foreign exchange, huge moves, monster moves in FX last week. Euro dollar had its best week going back two years. Sterling the same. Dolly yen was negative 5% last week. It's the biggest weekly move, Lisa, going back to October 2008, except October 2008 was risk off and last week was risk on. Yeah. So it makes sense of how the yen has behaved over the year so far. Looking for dollar weakening for some sort of reprieve. And basically that was what they got. How long this can last, though? And you have a bunch of notes that came out with people gaming out both sides of the story. How much does this really give a reprieve to a highly unconventional monetary experiment over in Japan, especially given that we have not gotten below 7.7% CPI inflation, which is still a very hot number, as Chris Waller reminded us of. The number one question in the commercial breaks when we speak to 
guests who are about to come up. I've asked it, Lisa's asked it. When's your 2023 outlook coming out? I think we were all reflecting on that over the last week. Who on earth wants to press send on that thing? Morgan Stanley have done it, I know, overnight. But yeah. come on, 2023, that's a difficult year to forecast. And how often have we heard, basically, can we just go into a bunker, put our head under a pillow and just wake up next year and have it be flat and just miss all the volatility in between? I always say wait until March. It takes about three months to work out what you were wrong about, and that's when you get the new forecast. That's when they start. Around March time, it's like, yeah, we didn't get that right. Okay, we're going to bring you a new forecast for year end. And if next year is like this year, around April, May is when they revise that and give the next year ahead outlook because basically it's been a year every month or so. That's the game on Wall Street right <laughs> now. George Concarvis has got to play it, head of US macro <laughs> strategy at MUFG. George, before we get to the outlook stuff, I know Lisa wants to talk about it. Let's talk about the move last week. Does that resonate with you, the way we moved last week? Are you pushing back against that? Uh, completely am. I mean, I was expecting a consolidation and we got a bolt out of the blue. And I think this is really just, again, reflective of you know, 2022 and how the sort of price action that we have where you know, the illiquidity works on both sides. In this case, we had a, you know, a, a, a setup of really negative sentiment, a decent exhaustion amongst you know investors on both sides, but the bears can only push it so far. And, and, you, and you had positioning also there too, especially in rates, but even in equities as well. And so it was kind of like this perfect setup for an overshoot in the other direction. I mean, I mean moves that we haven't seen in months, if not ever, uh, in such a short time period, time frame. Those things to me are not sustainable. We should be consolidated, not ripping like this, and then having to kind of give it all back. That's not healthy, in my opinion. And I think that yeah, that really kind of just reflects on the sort of conditions that we're in right now, which is an illiquid period where people don't have conviction. When Governor Wallace says calm down, what do you think he means? <clears throat> well, those two days or so really – unwounds a lot of the financial conditions tightening that the Fed did the month prior. And so, I mean, the Fed really needs financial conditions to stay tight. They don't want it to be loosening while they're still trying to get their arms around inflation, regardless that perhaps we've seen the peak of inflation and we're heading lower. I mean, we just don't know what, what that trajectory looks like and how low will inflation really get. So, you know, calming down is, hey, we're not done yet. And you guys are getting ahead of this. Well, that's only one side of the story. I was reading a George Saravello's note from Deutsche Bank talking about how Friday was a big day. The peak in the dollar is behind us. That was the title of this. And he was saying it wasn't just with respect to the CPI, but also because China has made noise about perhaps opening up a little bit more. And we also have seen a bit of a retreat from Russia, uh, from Ukraine. How much do you give credence to some of these geopolitical moves as having a sustainable effect on U.S. markets? Look, I think they help on the margin. I think that still you know, the cumulative effect of Fed tightening and what still lies ahead. I mean, we have at least a, at least two hikes, at least I think, or or the equivalent of two hikes or, or, or three, perhaps uh, in, the, in the next uh, quarter or two. I still think the Fed policy still outweighs that, and the cumulative effect of that will really be felt in Q1, Q2 of next year. I just think that we haven't really felt the the, the massive tightening that's happened. And this is also true for global liquidity. So even though on the margin, it's kind of good to see the news that we're seeing out of the Russia-Ukraine situation and also China potentially reopening slowly, I just don't think it's going to be the equivalent like what, we, what we're anticipating or expecting like in 2008 when China really led the charge. I think it's going to kind of like tiptoe into it. It's not going to be the same effect. It hasn't been very fun to press send on the year ahead outlooks, as John has been talking about. Andrew Sheets did it of Morgan Stanley. He said next year will be the year of yield and said that that's really where you're going to see an outperformance in certain credit instruments that have not done as well this year, particularly higher rated ones. You're not going to see the same kind of returns for stocks and you are going to see dollar weakness. Do you agree broadly with that kind of outlook heading into a year where you can see actual yield for the first time that we haven't seen going into a year for many, many decades. No, I, I do. And the thing is, you know, we were kind of joking around initially as well uh, about the outlook situation and when to send our reports. I mean, most of us, when we're creating our views, we, we have like the, the, the benefit of recent history. And then we try to extrapolate forward and have some sort of view on the macro as well, market pricing. And then that's been so hard this year. And so what ends up happening is most of those trades that you think are going to happen in, in the following year happen in, in Q4. And then by the time Q1 comes around, you do have to revise them. So I do think, yes, there's been decent enough yield pickup and that, you know, the safer parts of credit makes sense. I mean, I've been relatively defensive all year. I still think, you know, you can, on the margin, um, start to weigh in and average into credit. But if we are truly going to still have some sort of slowdown, I don't think we've seen the delinquencies or the defaults pick up enough to compensate you for. I still, I still think you have moments where you'll have spread widening where you can average in even further. So I'm not really fully on board yet. George, what do you think is more important for 2023? Is it a path for growth or the path for inflation? I would say uh, the intersection of the two. So we're going to see the growth slow down. That's going to give cover for the Fed to pause in, in Q1. 
and, and it starts to maybe even pivot in December because we're going to get a lot of that data still ahead of us. Uh, and we have the minutes uh, next week, which we'll see how they're really their convictions on hawkishness. But nonetheless, I think we're, we're in the point of you know, peaking, pivoting, and, and then we're going to move towards growth being a, a larger concern. But it, I don't think you catch it fast enough until the second half of the year. So I do think that you know, an inflation will probably still be running around 4%, if not higher, up until the middle of the summer. So I still think it's going to be a combination of the two, but we'll be pivoting towards growth. George, concerns. we had a conversation last week at the end of last week about sequencing. Do you think inflation is rolling over before growth does? And how important is that when it comes to your call gun into next year? I mean, I think growth has been um, uh, really uh, volatile. And we haven't had, you know, we had a decent Q3. I think Q4 is going to be on the weaker side. Q1. So I think we're still chopping around the bottom in terms of growth. I think it's, you know, the, the inflation call still matters a lot uh, to, to make sure that we are truly seeing a turn here. I mean, one number does not make a trend, but the overall kind of conditions are in, in, the, in the different baskets uh, and the buckets within it. Inflation are suggesting that we're heading lower in enough categories. But I, I do think that, you know, if, if growth doesn't accelerate, then that's going to be a bigger problem. Right now, we're looking at markets that are pricing at a 4.9% terminal rate for the Fed next year. It had been 5.1%, 5.2% as of late last week, and that's clearly reshifted downward as a result of the CPI. Where do you think markets are wrong? Look, I think markets are wrong in terms of the longevity of how long the Fed can keep rates at these elevated levels. Anywhere between 45 and 5%-ish, we could always re-ratchet higher if inflation were to uh, Pick up again. Um, either way, though, somewhere between four, four and a half, four and a half to five percent is the levels of rates that the U.S. economy really cannot sustain. You know, every time the Fed finishes a cycle, we end up breaking something. It hasn't happened yet. Doesn't mean it won't happen. Uh, and you know, look, we, it, we struggled in Q4 of 2018 when the Fed funds was at 2.5 percent. Now we have an inflation problem, and I, and I get why the Fed is going uh, at double that sp that pace. But the, you know, the U.S. economy and the U.S. leverage system cannot take it. So, George, what do you see in the actual data that gives you confidence that the market is wrong? Well, I mean, I think the the actual uh, you know, slowly kind of deceleration within the auto sector I mean, the housing sector, of course, is taking a, a pretty big hit already and it has much further to go. I mean, the biggest collateral that backs up with the U.S. banking system is the real estate sector and the U.S. bond market, both one which got hit pretty hard this year which will be limping along into Q1, Q2 with massive losses still, unrealized maybe uh, for some, but still a pretty big hit there. And they have real estate losses, I think, that are still coming down the road. So that's going to really curtail the availability, availability of credit in, in the coming year. Hey, George, wonderful to hear from you, buddy, as always. George Concarvis there of MUFG on the path forward. Kind of dodged the question there about what's more important, the path for inflation or the path for growth, and said both <laughs> the intersection the between the two. When it comes to the path of inflation, three things matter. Ultimately, direction, pace, destination. Direction, is it secure? Are we rolling over now? Pace, that's the conversation we've got to have. And destination, where we land next year, no clue. Kelsey Burr of JP Morgan was talking about that kind of thing. I think that's what's most important to a lot of people in fixed income at the moment. Which is the reason why you saw Morgan Stanley. You also saw JP Morgan really shifting into top rated credit. And just like uh, we heard just then from George, this idea that you're going to see some of the defaults pick up the growth story, the growth trajectory really, really highlight itself in some of the out uh, underperformance of certain aspects of the market that have held in more securely this year. How much, though, have we already seen that? You know, how much have we already seen some of the downward revisions? How much more can we see before all of a sudden we get the other collateral damage from this? I mean, everyone's been saying the Fed's going to raise something, raise rates until something breaks. Well, how close are we to something breaking? What does that look like in a cycle of pretty well capitalized companies? We've talked about the outlooks. Did you see the outlook for 23 on inflation from Goldman? Yes. PCE, 2.9 percent year end 2023, down from 5.1 percent now. Three factors, the easing in supply chain constraints for the goods sector. One, two, a peak in shelter inflation post reopening. And three, slower wage growth driven by the ongoing rebalancing of the labor market. I love this term that gets thrown around, and this is not aimed at Goldman. This is everyone. The rebalancing of the labor market. What do they actually mean by the rebalancing? <laughs> of the labor market. They mean millions of jobs lost. Taking the demand out. Yeah, that's what that means. That basically, if you have perhaps uh, more jobs, but you also have perhaps more workers, or you have fewer jobs and you have more workers, then you can pay them less, basically. Bit of breaking news crossing a terminal just moments ago. This from CNN. Jeff Bezos planning to give most of his money to charity. Planning to give most of his money to charity. There's been questions about Jeff Bezos and his philanthropic efforts over the years. 
repeatedly. Did you see what he gave to Dolly Parton over the weekend? <laughs> what did he give to Dolly Parton? $100 million. Dollars. To Dolly Parton. That's the award, and basically you get to decide where you give it. You can give it to any organisation of her choosing, basically. But it's been a lot of years where he really has not been pre very present on the philanthropic scene. Interesting that he's coming out now in such a bold way. This from CNN. Jeff Bezos planning to give most of his money to charity. More on that a little bit later. And we'll catch up with Jerome Schneider at PIMCO. Looking forward to that conversation too. Equity futures right now down a third of 1% on the S&P. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. For the first time, President Biden and China's Xi Jinping have met face to face. Their meeting took place on the sidelines of the Group of 20 summit in Bali, Indonesia. The two leaders called for reduced tensions between the world's largest economies. Taiwan has become the biggest flashpoint. President Biden has repeatedly promised the U.S. would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese attack. Fed Governor Christopher Waller says there's still a ways to go before the central bank stops raising interest rates. He told a conference in Sydney that the rates will stay high for a while until inflation gets down closer to the Fed's target. Policymakers could lower the size of the rate hikes to 50 basis points at next month's meeting. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has signaled that Democrats will seek to extend the federal debt ceiling during the lame duck session of Congress. That avoids a potential fight with Republicans that Pelosi says could threaten the U.S.'s credit rating. Vote counting is still going on, and it hasn't been decided which party will control the House next. Major cryptocurrencies rallied today after Binance said it plans to set up an industry recovery fund. CEO Zhang Peng Zhao says the goal is to reduce further negative effects from the bankruptcy of rival crypto exchange FTX. The FTX explosion wiped out about 200 billion of crypto's market value in the past week. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. As the leaders of uh, our two nations, we share responsibility, in my view, to show that China and the United States can manage our differences, prevent competition from becoming anything ever near conflict, and to find ways to work together on urgent global issues that require our mutual cooperation. A meeting between President Biden and President Xi is underway on the sidelines of the G20 just before that kicks off. It's still ongoing. When it wraps up, we'll bring you the latest headlines and you will hear from the President of the United States. A news conference scheduled, I stress scheduled, for 8.30 Eastern time because Ramo often this stuff with political leaders never takes place on time. And we're expecting it to go longer because there's a lot of stuff they've got to hash through, don't they? And the current joins us right now, Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics Correspondent. Ender, we spoke to Anne-Marie about how this is playing out politically here in the United States and on the international stage. Can you tell us how this has played out domestically for this leader going into this meeting with his opposite number in the United States? Well, President Xi has a domestic audience just like any other leader in the world, John, and the rhetoric coming into the National Party Congress or through the, through the Congress a few weeks ago, obviously, was all about portraying Xi as all-powerful and enshrining China's place in the world and not taking a step backwards against any foreign powers. There hasn't really been any dramatic softening of the language heading into this meeting from the Chinese side either. Uh, that's why I think expectations are fairly managed on both sides, certainly on the Chinese side, and I think on the US and the global side in terms of what might come out of it. Uh, at the very least, China themselves probably want to put a floor under this relationship, that's for sure, and maybe see if they can eke out some concessions on the economic side of things. I don't think anyone's looking for anything on Xinjiang or Taiwan or Hong Kong and those hot-button human rights issues, but maybe uh, some concessions on trade tariffs, remember those, and uh, maybe some concessions on two-way people flows. The U.S. want more Chinese students and experts to be allowed to go work in China, and of course the U.S. has some similar requests as well. So. Uh, look, President Xi hasn't gone into this selling himself as a dove or a peacemaker or anything like that. The language uh, in the state press has been bold when it comes to President Xi's um, ambitions for China, and they're not going to change that just for one meeting. How much is the chip export from the U.S. a red line for China? It's obviously a red line. I mean, on a headline basis, it is very restrictive for the development of of how China wants to create a world-class, both advanced military, world-class technology, industrial know-how. Across the spectrum of things, they need that access to that 
uh, to those semiconductors and this technological know-how. So it's a, it is a big blow or restraint to China's economy, Lisa. However, the flip side is there are those who argue it's a near-term hit and all it will do is ultimately accelerate China to push along with its own development of its own technology, which it wants to do anyway, to cut its reliance and dependence off the rest of the world. It will look elsewhere, it will source material where it, it can. Uh, so it's definitely a blow to the Chinese economy, but there are views out there that this might actually pretend to uh, lead itself to something bigger down the tracks. This has been one of the biggest questions, and uh, how many hits can the Chinese economy take before they start to care about the Chinese economy ahead of some of the other measures that uh, Xi Jinping has been talking about? And overnight, it seems like perhaps we saw the beginning of that with an easing, a broad easing of the housing sector, of the development sector in China. How much is that a shifting point for Xi Jinping in terms of re-emphasizing the economy in a way that a lot of people thought that his speech at the Chinese Party Congress really didn't show? Yeah, a lot of people haven't really seen this turn coming. They've been waiting for it at least, but haven't seen it coming. It gives Xi a bit of a tailwind heading into those talks with Biden because the sentiment towards China's economy has definitely improved in the last few days. We had that pivot. You can argue about the scale of it, but there was a pivot to some extent on COVID-0 last week. Then to your point on real estate, a 16-point plan coming out which involves basically uh, ensuring developers can get liquidity if they need it. There's some assistance for them on paying back their loans. They're allowed to get back a certain portion of, uh, get access to a certain portion of their pre-sold uh, homes financing, etc. So, and obviously the market's taking this very positively. We had several economists, including Citigroup today, calling it quite material. They, in fact, said it was a game changer. But the housing sector is still in a fairly fragile space. Prices are declining. Uh, defaults on mortgages are still continuing. So the housing sector turnaround has a long way to go. All I would say is that the broader sentiment on China has definitely improved in the last few days. And if the Xi-Biden meeting went somewhat well in the world of global markets, as in if it was seen to put at least put a floor on the relationship, then it certainly won't do any harm towards the risk sentiment uh, when it comes to Chinese assets. And did people misread what's happened in China? A number of weeks ago, we were talking about a president, a leader that was emboldened by securing more power, reinforcing the power he already had over the country. And a lot of people thought that meant he would stick with COVID zero. And did we, did, all, did we all misread what ultimately took place on the ground? What's happening here? I wouldn't say misread, and I won't pretend I can explain everything that's happening there either, John. But I think the point is that, on, on, look, on the one hand, they are pivoting on some of these measures. They are relaxing some of the restrictions around COVID-0 because they know they need to connect to the world economy again, and they know it's buckling growth and consumer sentiment on the ground. We get data, by the way, tomorrow, expected to confirm that. On the other hand, though, they haven't exactly run a million miles away from COVID-0. There's still all kinds, all manner of restrictions in place on the ground right across China. So they haven't given up on COVID-0. They're just tweaking now and maybe signaling where they will be, you know, five, six months from now, further along that process. And again, same on property. Okay, there wasn't much signaling or language from the Congress about what they might do, but everyone knew they had to pivot on property. They have to put some kind of a floor under it. Sure. And we've got these... We've got these statements now. So it's just, it's kind of what was expected, but maybe the timing of it's what surprised people. And a wonderful to catch up, as always. And a current there of Bloomberg out of Hong Kong as this meeting between President Xi and President Biden is ongoing. As I've said repeatedly through this morning, a news conference expected by the President of the United States at 8.30 Eastern Time. So about one hour and I guess 40 minutes from now. The Wall Street Journal and others reporting coming into this meeting that a senior US official said that China is uncomfortable with Russia's rhetoric and invasion of Ukraine as these two leaders meet. And you wonder how much that's going to feature in this conversation, Lisa, that's happening right now. How much is it because of what they've seen, the economic devastation to Russia from their involvement in this, as well as the loss? I mean, essentially, you can read whatever you want, and there's a lot of conflicting discussion around the retreat from that region that they'd previously claimed. But how much are we basically seeing Russia concede on some small measures that they cannot win this war in the way that they thought that they could win? We've avoided the worst case this winter in Europe big time. Storage levels for gas were basically at capacity. The weather's turned out to be warmer. The fact that you have got signs of a, I don't want to call it a withdrawal yet, but certainly encouraging signs relative to what maybe we imagined a number of months ago. Better for Europe. Whether they can repeat the act next winter, I've got no idea whatsoever. But certainly we were worried about this point of the year already, facing maybe industry rolling blackouts, shutdowns across Germany and other places. And we're not seeing that in a major, major way. You've just mentioned the two reasons, other than the Federal Reserve, that George Cervello has put out there for the reason why he sees peak dollar, it already being in and seeing ongoing dollar weakness, because we have avoided the worst case in Europe. And sure. because we might be seeing some sort of loosening 
in China, I do keep going back to this Olaf Scholz comment from earlier today in Singapore, this idea that now the geopolitics of this come to the fore. And the, what I really want to hear from President Biden in about an hour and a half time, if he's on time, is how much is that hardening going to continue between China and the rest of the Western world? He won't be. Maybe he will, but I doubt he will be. <laughs> Thank you for We'll pick up on that story in the next hour. We'll talk about big tech and what's happening in crypto as well. A gentleman called Brian Chesky of Airbnb on Twitter. Of course, at the moment on Twitter, you've got no idea if that's actually Chesky of Airbnb, but whatever. He said, it feels like we were in a nightclub and the lights just turned on. Now, you read between the lines about what that actually means, but... This is the Warren Buffett quote. When the tide rolls out, you see who's naked. Is that what happens in the nightclub? <laughs> Let's leave it there. <laughs> My base case has the U.S. economy slowing, flirting with a recession. We think at a minimum, Fed funds gets to four and three quarters, five percent. The Fed needs to see more to say we can decelerate then from 50 down to 25 and ultimately pause at some point. There is no Fed right. member that wants to go down in history as losing the fight on inflation. We might actually have a scenario where we could have a soft landing because we are now seeing inflation begin to come down. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lee. Lisa Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning to you all as we kick off a brand new trading week. Alongside Lisa Brambert, I'm Jonathan Ferro. TK back in a couple of days. Equity futures lower. I guess if you want to blame someone, you can blame Governor Waller sure. down at Australia yesterday evening. I think that that's a fair person to blame considering that he came out and basically said stocks shouldn't rally too much more. <laughs> basically. Calm down, breathe. Calm down, breathe, the advice from a Federal Reserve official. <laughs> well, he basically is saying don't get carried away with CPI, that basically this isn't the necessarily a downward trend with one data point. And they've been saying this for a while, but people saw suddenly a downward surprise after so many upward surprises of inflation. Have we gotten to the point of some sort of tipping uh, into some sort of disinflationary moment? The three ingredients to the rally last week. One was the downside surprise on CPI. The other was gridlock in Washington. We'll see about that because yeah. that's still not confirmed. And Good we'll discuss point. that a little bit later this hour. The third piece of it was China reopening. There is a meeting happening right now between President Biden and President Xi on the sidelines of the G20. Are we looking for anything to come out of that whatsoever? No, I think the answer is no. Although there might be some sort of signaling, in particular Xi Jinping's openness to uh, perhaps allowing more international businesses to come in. I do wonder, though, how much they'll take it. Because did you see the stories about big businesses, banks, retrenching quietly from China, sure. laying people off? How much is this because of political risk and how much is this just because the economy is not really taking off the way that other economies are? A news conference coming up with the president a little bit later. Bramo is going to give you the time of that in just a moment. I'll whip through the price action for you and begin with the S&P 500 coming off the back of the biggest weekly gain on the S&P since June. On the Nasdaq, biggest weekly gain on the Nasdaq 100 going back to November 2020. Futures this morning down a third of 1% on the the S&P in the bond market yields higher. Treasuries, of course, cash treasuries closed on Friday, reopening Monday this morning. Yield time by eight basis points on a 10-year to 389.12. In the FX market, the euro strength, in fact, the everything strength against the US dollar last week was phenomenal. Flip it around just a little bit this morning. Euro dollar Bramo, 102.82. We're negative there, six tenths of 1%. John, you said that I'd give you the time for that meeting, that press conference of President Biden. I will, but it will be wrong, as he pointed out, because he will be late, right? 8.30 a.m. is when the scheduled press conference is from President Biden taking questions in Bali. We're also going to get a host of Fed speak today. Perhaps we'll hear a similar comment uh, from either Lael Brainerd at 11.30 a.m. with conversation with Bloomberg's Peggy Collins or perhaps from Fed President, uh, New York Fed President John Williams at 6.30 p.m. Similar to what we heard from Chris Waller. Basically, take a deep breath. One data point does not change our ultimate path, and we are headed to a more restrictive future. Does it really matter? Or are markets basically just going to go where they're going to go? And we're going to get uh, the kicking off of the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Singapore tonight. Speakers including Dr. Henry Kissinger, former U.S. Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. Catherine Tai, U.S. Trade Representative to China. I am actually very curious to hear what she has to say, John, given that the trade aspect might be the most interesting thing that could come from these meetings. Less the reopening with respect to COVID, because they're not going to make some sort of announcement here at this meeting. But do we get a sense of some sort of pulling back of some of the tariffs from the United States. Also on the chip sector, how substantially will that be curtailed or expanded based on this conversation? Well, let's start with tariffs more broadly. How many times have they floated that over the last 12 months? Yeah, and it's I've not I've been waiting popular. for a decision on that for ages. If you want to talk about the chip specifically, Japan confused by this? 
the Europeans confused by this. They're trying to work out what it means for them. Sure, because it also uh, perhaps has a more domestic quality that keeps things in the United States and curtails other partnerships. At the same time, President Biden has a new mandate, ostensibly, because he did not experience the red wave that so many people were expecting. What's he going to do with that? to show that he has a hard line with China, especially because that is the one bipartisan issue in the United States right now. I keep saying gridlock. Gridlock not secure. It's not gridlock. Not, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Let's see what happens with the House because that's still not confirmed either, right? And people were rallying that has not been confirmed yet. People were rallying around the idea that there would be gridlock. Now that there's not, does that get undone in markets? Right? I mean, basically, are people then going to start to talk about more fiscal spending? Just go back two years. Do you remember the outcome of the election in November 2020? And you remember once everyone said gridlock, we want gridlock, right. gridlock, gridlock. Then we got a blue wave or a blue mist, whatever you want to call it. And then the market just ripped. Do you remember it just ripped? Yeah, I, but this is, again, the narrative that everyone was talking about. Gridlock is good, right? And then now we're getting something that doesn't look that much like gridlock. And we're not seeing a huge retrenchment that people saying, oh, no, consensus is bad. Just a final word on Vice Chair Brainerd. That's happening at a Bloomberg Bureau event with Peggy Collins, yeah. our bureau chief down in Washington. So looking forward to that. And I believe we'll bring you some coverage a little bit later on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio, 11.30 Eastern Time. Scheduled to take place, and typically we're a little bit more on track on time than I think we could say it's political fun. leaders in, in Bali at the G20. <laughs> Priya Misra joins us now, the head of global race strategy at TD Securities. Priya, it's the question that every strategist fears right now. How's the 23 outlook coming along? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, every year it's tough, but I would say this year we're debating the economic outlook, inflation, growth. I actually think uh, that the growth outlook will become more interesting as, as we go into 23. And the Fed reaction function. We normally don't have uncertainty on all these aspects, plus a fairly liquid market positioning. I mean, just look at the uh, the reaction on Thursday. I think it tells you it's it's never easy, but I think this year is particularly hard. You're supposed to take these outlooks with a pinch of salt or a fistful of salt and be nimble. So, uh, but but we're all going to be writing it over the next uh, you know couple of weeks. Do you have any convictions whatsoever, Priya? You know, I do think I I, I think liquidity is important. Um, you know, so I think making sure that you've got enough liquid assets so that you're not forced to sell what you don't want to sell. I think that is, uh, I, I would say, a theme that we've had this year. I, th I think that continues. The other big conviction I have is I know that the, the data right now is still strong. Um, uh, you know, we, we think inflation is going to be, it's it's less about the peak. It's how quickly it's going to decline. So I think we're going to move from whether we've peaked to that pace of decline. If the pace of decline is shallow, which is actually our, our call here, the Fed's going to stay restrictive for longer. And, that, and so a recession Recession is almost a done deal. So we've got these views around sticky inflation, recession. It's timing that, trading that. That's going to be hard. I still like 10-year treasuries. I mean, I don't know why we moved 30 basis points on Thursday. So that can absolutely be undone a little bit. But I think owning some duration risk, which has been shunned by investors all through this year, I think it's actually it actually makes sense to start to position for duration coming back. Um, you know, the the ten year should not be around four percent if you're heading into a recession. <laughs> Priya, I'm not going to let that go. I have no idea why it rallied thirty basis points uh, on Friday or on Thursday, rather Friday. The bond market was closed. So, what do you do with these types of moves? How do you understand them in terms of a positioning and liquidity standpoint, and what that means in terms of coming up with some sort of trade? So, as Governor Wallace said you know, to be calm, to to breathe. I think that's actually good advice. The market has been extremely volatile. You know, when we track standard deviation of 10-year changes, this is the highest we've seen, including the 70s, in terms of how much the 10-year, when the risk-free rate moves that much, you can just imagine positioning the importance of flows. I think understanding that the market is not as liquid, dealers have constrained capacity. I think that's important, which is why you're supposed to keep some cash. I think bills are actually attractive. You know, keep money in the front end uh, to, to make sure that if the moves are excessive, you don't have to sell, there's no fire sale, you can potentially put money to work. I think being nimble, I think all of this is, uh, you know, we shouldn't see this as a one-off, maybe positioning was, was particularly exaggerated. I see it as a structural issue and something I think we have to get used to, particularly because we have a data-dependent Fed. It's very different from when forward guidance was there. You could actually expect volatility to stay low. I think volatility stays high all through next year. It's just the market focus will shift from inflation to growth. With that in mind, Priya, how much influence does this Fed have on the long end, on the 10-year? 
You know, I actually think they do. I don't know why they don't talk as much about QT. They are letting about 100 billion of treasuries and mortgages run off the balance sheet every single month. I think that's the reason why the long end of the treasury curve has underperformed. There's a lot more supply. There's mortgages, which are also long duration. And the market's looking for that marginal buyer. So I do think that they have control. Um, you know, at some point, I do think QT is going to end. Once they start to ease, we actually have them starting to ease. I know I just talked about sticky inflation, but if the unemployment rate is at 5% or higher and inflation's getting down to 3%, we actually think then the trade-off will look, uh, will start to skew the Fed towards rate cuts. And I think if the Fed starts to cut rates, they're going to stop QT. And so while people think that's really a front-end trade, no, if quantitative tightening stops, I think the 10-year has a lot more room to go. So I do think that they have control over the long end. They just don't talk about that control a whole lot. Priya, when you press send on that outlook, come and see us, right? Priya Misra of TD Securities, thank you. As always, what a challenge for anyone to come up with an outlook for 2023. Lisa and I mentioned a little bit earlier that Morgan Stanley have done so. Anna Zetner leading the economics outlook over at Morgan Stanley for 2023. The title... By a whisker, I'll bring you a quote from that. The US economy barely skirting recession in 23, but the landing does not feel soft. She goes on to say the cumulative effect of tight policy in 23 spills over into 24, resulting in two very weak years. So this, I guess, is a multi-year outlook from the team at Morgan Stanley. Only in the second half of 24 does the economy climb back near its potential of 1.5%, Lisa, with the Fed having cut the policy rate back to neutral. Well, and I think it's fair to ask, based on what uh, Ellen Zentner is saying, what kind of recession, when people say a recession is baked in, is it even a technical recession or is it just incredibly slow growth or a lost decade or a lost five years? And how much are people going to start talking about the duration of exactly what Priya Misra was talking about? If you keep rates restrictive for longer because of a shallow decline in inflation, it has a very different outlook than a rapid decline in inflation like uh, like uh, we, uh, we're seeing from the Goldman Sachs analysts. And she's not ready to press send on 23. No, no one is. No one is. I mean, come on. How do you press send hey, on this? It's tough. Maybe Jerome Schneider has of PIMCO. He's going to join us in the next hour. Looking forward to that conversation. I mentioned some news from CNN in the previous hour on Jeff Bezos. Here's the lead paragraph. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos planning to give away the majority of his $124 billion net worth during his lifetime, telling CNN in an exclusive conversation he will devote the bulk of his wealth to fighting climate change and supporting people who can unify humanity in the face of deep social and political divisions. Katie Martin of the Financial Times, who's a must-follow on Twitter, asking a couple of questions, Bramo. Does that mean huge pay rises for staff, massive overpayments of tax bills? <laughs> dot, dot, dot. No? Question mark? The subtext, is this an elaborate public relations effort on behalf of Jeff Bezos? That's what you're perhaps conveying. I'm not saying perhaps anything. I'm I just am. asking questions Oh, of course. Yes, clearly. Futures are down Swagger. four tenths of one percent. Bramo with tons of swag. <laughs> This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden and China's Xi Jinping had their first ever in-person meeting today. They shook hands before sitting down at a hotel in Bali, Indonesia. The city is the site of the Group of 20 summit. The president told Xi the two have a responsibility to show that China and the U.S. can prevent competition from turning into conflict. In Turkey, authorities say Kurdish militant group PKK and its U.S.-backed affiliates in Syria were behind a deadly bomb attack in Istanbul. The explosion killed at least six people and wounded 81 in the city's tourist district. Turkey says a suspect has been captured and identified her as a Syrian national. In the U.K., Chancellor of the Exchequer Jeremy Hunt is expected to delay much of the $65 billion spending cuts and tax hikes until after the next election. That would both protect the economy and shore up support for the Conservative Party as the country heads into recession. Bloomberg's learned the bulk of the savings would be delivered in the final years of the five-year forecast. Shares of Japan's SoftBank plunged today. The company failed to announce a widely expected stock buyback. Plus, SoftBank's core vision fund posted a $7.2 billion loss in the July through September quarter. Sliding startup valuations have forced the world's biggest technology investor to go into defensive mode and virtually halt investments. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
President Biden has been a great president for our country. He has accomplished so much. Uh, 10 million jobs, over 10 million jobs under his leadership. He has Finally. been a great president. He has a great record to run on. That was Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, on ABC over the weekend, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. If you're just tuning in, here's the state of the price action. Going into the opening bell a couple of hours away, two hours and 12 minutes away, to be somewhat precise. Equity futures are negative on the S&P 500, down a third of 1%. Yields a bit higher by eight basis points on a 10-year to 389.68 in the FX market. Euro dollar negative seven-tenths of 1%, 102.78. And there at the moment, yields up dollar strength and equities lower off the back of Governor Waller comments from the Federal Reserve, basically telling everyone to calm down after CPI came in below expectations last week. Calm down and take a deep breath. Not even my words. I'm basically paraphrasing. They were basically his words on the calm down and take a deep breath stuff. He does not want to be in the situation they were in in July, where the data and the market ran away and you've got this premature of easing financial conditions and that's not what they want to be in. How much are they going to cap how much stocks can rally? That's ultimately the question I have to say. I was listening to Nancy Pelosi. and Did you watch some of the Sunday shows over the weekend, the political Sunday shows? Sure. The change in tone from Republicans around former President Trump. How much is he going to really announce tomorrow that he is running for president at a time when a lot of people don't want to see that happen? The Murdoch media. I've already started to turn. I mentioned that too on Friday. I just want to finish on crude. If you can get that board back up that we were going through, it's stocks, bonds, FX, commodities are in focus off the back of this. Crude's down by about 1.3% at $87.80. OPEC reduced its forecast for global oil demand again. The group implementing production cutbacks aimed at keeping markets in balance. And this basically plays into their whole theory right now that they think the economy is rolling over. It's why they think they need to cut production. And crude's back, Lisa, to about 87, 82. How does this work with the China reopening story, given that we're hearing about that and Xi Jinping and President Biden are meeting right now? It's a big question. AMH joins us right now over in Bali. On a sideline to the G20, our Washington correspondent. Amri, the meeting's ongoing. What did you hear going into it that tells you something about what's going to happen coming out the other side? Meetings ongoing, and what we heard from Jake Sullivan, Jonathan, is that it could be a couple of hours. The two sides did take a break, and now they've resumed these discussions. We are not expecting any deliverables or big announcements. There's going to be no joint statement following this meeting, but the president will give a press conference, and that'll give us hints about what was discussed. We do know that three of the biggest issues that are going to be discussed at the table are clearly Putin's invasion of Ukraine, where Xi Jinping hasn't materially really helped Russia, but at the same time, they have not come out and criticize Putin, and Putin still considers Xi Jinping a friend on the international stage. Of course, there's the fact that the U.S. has released wide-sweeping curbs on a semiconductor and really advanced technology that China desperately will need if it wants to advance its not just technology space, but military space. And then the one that is going to be the most contentious, of course, is going to be what is going on with Taiwan and the Taiwanese Strait. This we saw play out in the open this summer when Speaker Pelosi made that trip to to Taiwan. We saw military drills by China in the Taiwan Strait. We saw China revoke some communications with the United States, whether it was military comms or climate communication that they were working on. And that is why this meeting comes at such an important time. And we've heard from U.S. officials that even the planning of this meeting started to warm relations a bit. But really for the U.S., they say this is about setting guardrails for the rules of the road something they've been trying to do since 2021. And Marie, does the U.S. and President Biden really want a warmer relationship right now with Xi Jinping? Well, what we hear from the U.S. is that they want to have competition with China, not conflict. And it's an interesting moment because it comes on the heels of the president in Cambodia meeting a number of Asian allies. He sat down with the Australian leader, Japanese leader, and South Korea leader. And these countries uh, really were, first off, a little bit concerned about the provocation that they saw from China after Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. And they want to calm down what is going on in terms of U.S.-China relations. They want a stable approach because these countries not only have military bases on their land, so if U.S. was drawn into any conflict, they would also be uh, on, on the fringes of that conflict. But also other things when it comes to the chips. This is something that Japan and South Korea are also haven't fully backed 
adopt the U.S. approach. And this is something that China says the U.S. is trying to maintain uh, the uh, hegemony within the international order. So on these kind of topics, allies want to see the U.S. and China communicating. And the president said he spoke to allies, or his team said he spoke to allies before going into this meeting. So potentially, President Biden heard some of their concerns. MH, just briefly, Russia, of course, at the epicenter of some of these conversations. And Marie, can you tell us what happened with the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in the last 24 hours? Some conflicting reports and a message from Lavrov Good himself. Of- There was, a, there was a report from the Associated Press that Sergei Lavrov, who is here instead of President Putin, who uh, for a second year, he didn't go to the G20 in Rome, not attending the G20 in Bali, he is representing the Russian delegation. There was a report that he was hospitalized. Bloomberg News asked the foreign ministry if that was true, and then he released a video statement showing himself saying that the Bloomberg News report is false. Now, he released this statement, uh, a video, he's working during it, but we don't know exactly when this video was taken uh, and exactly the timestamp of it. Uh, but that has been the conflicting reports here on the ground in Bali, the health of Sergei Lavrov, a critically important person because he is representing Russia also begs the question of whether or not they're going to be able to sign up to a joint communique, which, Jonathan, I know you've been talking about for weeks. MH, we'll see if that can happen. Anne-Marie, thank you. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie through the week, of course, through the G20. It is going to be tremendously difficult to get 20 countries to agree on absolutely anything. And one idea that I've got is essentially maybe if you have a communique, does it read like Fed Minutes? One country thinks this, another group of countries thinks that. Is that the only way you can produce any kind of communique whatsoever a little bit later? And how much is there a bigger takeaway from this? We'd hear about the deglobalization or the regionalized globalization, reshoring, all of that. How much do we see evidence of where the alliances are coming out of this G20? And that might be the biggest takeaway more than some sort of global uh, communication because is there a global goal at this point that all of the nations can really co- uh, coalesce around? Got an appetizer for the G20 in the 18-nation East Asia Summit. There was no communique, no statement after that either. The Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov reportedly refusing to describe the invasion of Ukraine as a war and insisting, Lisa, that it was still called, quote, a military, a special military operation. Well, and let's see if China can get behind that, right? I mean, okay, so Russia has been trying to uh, communicate some sort of lessening in terms of the significance of what is a war by all uh, by all measures. How much is China getting bored with that? Coming up on this program a little bit later this morning, you should hear from the President of the United States in a news conference on the sidelines of the G20. It's scheduled to take place at 8.30 Eastern time. On this program, I can guarantee you next, we'll catch you with Stuart Kaiser of City because I've just seen him. From New York, this is Bloomberg. (laughs) Typically on a Monday morning, I'll say what a week coming up. What a week last week was. Can we just sit on last week? That was ridiculous. It was ridiculous, I think is fair. I'm not even sure I can say what a week coming up this Monday morning, but here's the price action for you anyway. Your equity market looks a little something like this on the S&P 500. Equity futures are negative on the S&P. We're down only about a third of 1%. Call it a quarter if you're feeling constructive. And then that's that 100, we're down a half of 1%. Last week, just phenomenal. Biggest weekly gain since June on the S&P. Biggest weekly gain since November 2020 on the Nasdaq 100. In the bond market, yields on twos across four trading days on the week, down about 33 basis points. The bulk of that came on Thursday post-CPI. Your two-year right now at four basis points, the 437.61. Yields bleed a little bit higher. Governor Waller pushing back overnight against some of the euphoria in the bond market off the back of one downside surprise on CPI. Vice Chair Brain had coming up a little bit later, sitting down with our Bloomberg Washington Bureau Chief Peggy Collins down in D.C. at 11.30 Eastern time. Looking forward to that. Want to finish up in foreign exchange. Major moves last week on cross a couple of currency pairs. Euro, one of them. Euro dollar, biggest weekly move going back two years. Similar move on cable, the pound against the US dollar. Dollar yen, though. Keep going back to dollar yen. Lisa, dollar yen, a 5% move lower. The biggest weekly move going back to October 2008.
It's the Widowmaker trade tried to short uh, what's going on over in Japan, and we have seen that repeatedly. And at this point, how much of a temporary pause is this and how much more sustainable in terms of dollar weakness? I'm taking a look at a number of names. I want to start on Amazon, given Jeff Bezos coming out as a new philanthropic kind of push, talking about giving away the bulk of his money over his tenure. Of course, this comes after a lot of criticism over his lifetime about not really being overly philanthropic. He has $124 billion of net worth. Those shares, just as far as the why here, those shares are down about 43% over the past year. I mean, they're poised for possibly the worst yearly loss going back to 2008 and possibly to 2000. So that's part of the backdrop here. Walmart and Home Depot, uh, we have seen most of the earnings come through from the S&P, but uh, Walmart and Home Depot are lined up for tomorrow to release before the opening bell. Walmart shares have actually outperformed dramatically, and part of this is because they've been able, with their heft, to really manage some of the supply chain constraints and margin uh, compression that other companies have had a harder time with. Those shares only lower by 3.5% year to date in Home Depot shares. I want to hear what they have to say. Those shares down 15 and percent year to date. But I wonder, John, how much are we going to see discussion about what mortgage rates at 7 percent, what the slowdown in housing costs does to Home Depot? Do people invest in their homes and try to stay there because they don't have as much mobility or do they pull back because they don't have the new homes to decorate, et cetera? That's usually a really big part of uh, personal expenditures just generally in the, the United States. The discipline of 4 percent Fed funds has changed the game in a massive way. You brought up Amazon. Andy Jassy, the CEO of Amazon, there was a report in the journal last week, the cost-cutting review is coming to Amazon. It's hit Facebook, Meta, in a major way. I mentioned this stat last week. It was in the journal's write-up. Between the end of 2019 and the end of 21, Amazon hired more than 800,000 employees. I had to read that quote about 10 different times just to make sure I hadn't got the number wrong. That is just a monster number in a really, really small amount of time. I'll give you another monster number. The Amazon has lost a trillion dollars of market value so far this year. It is the first company to ever lose a trillion dollars of market value because until recently, we never had a lot of companies with trillion dollar market values, yet here we are. Quote of the morning came from Stuart Kaiser. It came actually yesterday evening as I was sitting there on the Bloomberg. It dropped from City in the inbox and it read as follows. Timing is the key word for markets. He went on to say, for data, will inflation crest before growth deteriorates and let the FOMC deal with those risks to its mandate separately? For markets, how long an investable window is there between those two waves of economic risk? Stuart joins us right now. Stu, awesome to catch up. Let's start there. I think it's really important. I've heard it a couple of times over the last week now. The sequencing of what happens with growth and inflation and what rolls over more quickly and what rolls over first. Where are we now? It's a great question. Good morning. Uh, you know, I think the, the challenge here is I think when the Fed started hiking, they were hoping inflation would sort of already have crested by now and they would sort of, you know, be able to deal with the growth weakness as it came. As Lisa mentioned, housing has started to slow down. That's kind of one of those early indicators that growth is going to slow down in the future. You know, I think what the Fed is hoping and markets are hoping is we had a softer print last week. We'll get a softer print hopefully in December, and that'll be evidence that that inflation started to come down at a time when unemployment is still sub 4 percent, right? And that's kind of a, a really nice balance for the Fed, especially because based on lags of monetary policy, we haven't seen their rate hikes really hit the economy yet, <laughs> right? So they really need this inflation problem to get under control before that starts to happen. You mentioned that investable window. Is that basically the window before growth collapses? <laughs> Essentially, yeah, I, mean, I think it is, right? It's, it's the window between, hey, inflation looks like it's peaked, the Fed can back off on rate hikes, and uh-oh, you know, the unemployment rate is rising and other, other forms of economic growth are slowing, exactly. How well can you actually time this market, though, if you're looking at something that is flip-flopped by, you know, 10 percent in a week? I, I mean, I, I don't think you can, and I think that's why the investable windows are really, really short. Um, it's why, you know, you're not taking uh, victory laps or kind of riding positions too long. I think clients are in and out of positions as quickly as possible, you know, just for that reason. Um, it does feel like the market's moving data point to data point at this at this time, and I think that's why right now are people are already asking what are non-farm payrolls going to look like in early December? What is that inflation print going to look like in December? December, the markets are pricing almost a 2.8 percent S&P move on the CPI in the middle of December. So it just gives you a sense of how much risk is priced for that day already, you know, sitting here. And we're not even to Thanksgiving. Is it easier to look longer term, especially at the leadership? And we were talking to Lori Calvacina about the leadership and the rally that we've seen in big tech recently over the past couple of sessions. And she sees that it could be sustainable. Do you agree that there is some sort of return, the rise of the big tech behemoths as leaders? <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I don't think we're I don't think I'm behind that fully yet. I, there could be. It could not be. I think it's just it's impossible to tell I mean, Look, 
tech should work if the pressure from rates eases a bit. I think the challenge with tech for me at this point is the beginning of the year, this was a valuation discussion, right? We're going to push yields higher. That's going to push PEs down for the NASDAQ. Third quarter earnings were not about valuation, right? Those are about actual fundamentals and what's going on in growth, what's going on with Amazon, Facebook, everybody laying off employees. So I think the question here for tech is, if I take that pressure off from rates, do I get a valuation re-rating? Or do people take a step back and say, I need to see how this, this cost-cutting initiative plays out? Which is why it's, I think tech is a really tricky trade right here, just for that reason. I keep going back to this Brian Chesky tweet. John, I mean, you brought this up and I keep thinking about it. Yeah, it feels like we were in a nightclub and the lights just turned on. And I keep thinking about this in terms of... I need Brian of... to tell me what happens when the light goes on. <laughs> oh, yeah, because you have no I idea. Don't know what he's about. Clearly, that's obviously very true. I'm curious, though, what else is there that's going to get exposed, John? Well, how, how big is the iceberg? is basically what I'm trying to work out and everybody's trying to work out. And I saw all those comments over Twitter over the weekend. How big is the iceberg? Let's talk about crypto, for instance, and I think this is the big question right now. To what degree have we had widespread institutional adoption? With that in mind, how much scope is there for contagion from that asset class across to traditional asset classes? And the number one question I'm filled in right now is for people that never touch crypto, never touch Bitcoin, and they want to understand what does it mean for me? What does it mean for me? And what are the risks around these stories right now? What are they? What are you telling clients? Look, I think, I think that question really relates to what is the Fed going to break? Essentially, you had 10 years of easy monetary policy. You've now hiked massively over a short period of time. And I think a lot of clients are thinking, well, if they're able to hike this much over a short time, not create a hard landing in the economy and not break any asset classes, that's going to be you know, the accomplishment of a lifetime. So, you know, crypto was one that people have pointed to, and that was a beneficiary of easy money. Um, you know, is that is that the evidence? Is it something like the yen? Is it is it easy credit? Is it housing? And this is why it's just very hard to sort of step in and say over a medium term horizon, I'm comfortable owning risk here because we haven't had sort of that moment, right? That moment where an asset class that you didn't expect to kind of come under pressure has. So I, it's, it's a great question. How big is it? I mean, you've, you've seen the size of the balance sheet. <laughs> you know, you've seen, you know, negative rates in Europe. Um, you've seen crypto go where it went. You've seen tech performance where it was. I mean, if there's an iceberg, it's fairly big, right? Because all of these trends have been extremely powerful and for an extended period of time. So I think that's why a lot of clients haven't fully re-risked and why they're not fully bought in yet, because there's a sense that there is something out there that, that hasn't worked itself out yet. We hear from economists that we haven't built up that much excess. We've been asking on this program, well, what are you talking about? The excess of the last two years or the excess of the last decade? What is the excess we need to unwind? The last two years or the last 10? I mean, I, I, have to, I would say it's the last 10, right? I mean, I, those are two, two separate topics. I think the last two years to me is much more a fiscal discussion of how much money the government spent. The last 10 years is much more a monetary discussion in terms of, in terms of you know, easier monetary policy. So, I mean, do you have to unwind all of that? Probably not, but you do have to unwind, I think, a portion of it. And the question I think there, for equities, that was a discussion about valuation, particularly of growth stocks and tech. And a lot of that got sort of dealt with earlier in the year. I think what a lot of clients struggle with is who have been the biggest beneficiaries of easy monetary policy? Um, you know, what have they invested in? <laughs> and have we seen what they've invested in kind of re-rate itself? And there's some questions out there. Real estate in particular, I think, is one people are really, really focused on. Um, and ultimately, yeah, we're just going to have to see how this plays out. But again, this is why I think it's hard to say, yeah, all clear. Once inflation peaks, we're good to go. Because again, if monetary policy acts with somewhere between a six and 18 month lag, depending on who you talk to, what was the Fed doing 12 months ago? Right. The Fed was at zero 12 months ago and they were buying bonds. So, you know, while we've hiked a bit, the uh, real estate market has weakened a bit. You know, there's a case to be made that a very small portion of this portion of this tightening has hit the markets um, other than maybe FCI, which is just the market itself anyway. Isn't that a scary thought? Um, if it wasn't holiday season, it would be. You know? <laughs> I was just going to say, I think that he hasn't written his review and he's not going to. And he's just basically coming on here to explain why a year ahead of you is not necessary and he can go home and enjoy his holidays. You should write the year ahead outlook <laughs> yes. in March. I say it all the time. Just they write do. it at the end of the first quarter. You That's also when write you it in November. The new forecast. <laughs> Stuart Kaiser, City. Stuart, it's great to see you again in Thank person you. in the studio. What Stuart's saying here about what did we build on top of low interest rates? Have we changed certain industries? And I would throw in not just low rates. I think Joe Weissenthal has been fantastic on this here at Bloomberg. It wasn't just the era of low rates. It was the era of cheap labor. 
And what's changed is that the cost of labor has gone up, the cost of capital has gone up, and the industries that have built on top of that, I'm thinking about cars, Uber, Lyft, all of the above. There's great dispersion there within these industries too. And then I'm thinking about media, the price of content, all of the above, and there's great dispersion there as well. And consolidation among some of the weaker players because all the second rands, how much do they get blown out because they don't have the cheap money or the cheap labor to keep going? Go and pick all of this over the next 12 months. It, it's going to be fascinating. Futures down about a quarter of 1% on ESP. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden and China's Xi Jinping both called for reduced tensions between the world's two largest economies. They met today on the sidelines of the Group of 20 Summit in Bali, Indonesia. As the leaders of uh, our two nations, we share responsibility, in my view, to show that China and the United States can manage our differences, prevent competition, from becoming anything ever near conflict, and to find ways to work together on urgent global issues that require our mutual cooperation. President Biden will hold a news conference later today. OPEC has reduced its forecast for a global oil demand again. That comes as the cartel implements production cutbacks designed to keep markets in balance. OPEC's latest report says a weaker economic backdrop and China's strict anti-COVID measures are among the reasons demand is dropping. A shooting at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville Sunday night left three people dead, two wounded. It took place at a parking garage on campus. Police are searching for a student who is described as armed and dangerous. And London's no longer the biggest stock market in Europe. The UK capital has lost its crown to Paris. According to an index compiled by Bloomberg, the combined market cap of primary listings in Paris overtook that of London in US dollar terms. Economic growth concerns are weighing on British assets. Meanwhile, China's relaxation of COVID rules is boosting French luxury sales. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. A lot of people have compared this to Lehman. I would compare it to uh, Enron. The uh, smartest guys uh, in the room, not just financial error, but certainly from the reports, uh, whiffs of uh, fraud. More than whiffs of it right now. That was Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, over the weekend on Wall Street Week with David West and a must watch as always. Your equity market looks like this on the SP 500. Equity futures negative through much of this morning. Blame someone, pick anyone. I guess you could pick Governor Waller if you really want to. Equity futures are down a third of 1%. That's not a massive move. Yields are up by what, six or seven basis points? In 2022, seven basis points is nothing. 388.18 on a 10 year euro dollar 103, reclaiming a 103 handle off the lows of the session. We're down about a half of 1%. Governor Wallace saying, take a deep breath, calm down before we run away with too much exuberance off the back of a downside surprise on CPI. Last week, Bramo. The fact that shares aren't down more tells you just how much the markets are buying into this. Because if you can blame Governor Waller, he actually isn't making that big of an impact given the rally that we saw at the end of last week. Vice Chair Brain is the one to watch a little bit yeah. later. 11.30 Eastern Time, sitting down with the Bloomberg Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief, Becky Collins. Looking forward to that conversation. There was a feeling when we were watching that statement come out on Fed decision day and then the news conference, there was a feeling that the statement was a nod towards Vice Chair Brainerd and the news conference was a nod towards everybody else. Well, that her cumulative tightening really stood out and then the press conference basically eradicated that by saying, and we don't really care because we're going to keep going and inflation is the preeminent concern. Does she push back against the hawkish tilt of the press conference in her discussion today with Peggy Collins? High rates are causing a lot of problems. What did Brian Chesky say? It feels like we're in a nightclub and the lights just got turned on. I guess that's true of crypto as well. Let's bring in Devon Ryan, Director of Financial Technology Research at JMP Securities. Devon, we've got to start with FTX. How on earth did we go from $32 billion valuations to zero, literally in seconds? Yeah, I mean, pretty um, amazing story here. I think first off, uh, you know, we're following the story and it looks a lot like um, you know, what happened in the financial crisis with the big banks and leverage and mismatch of assets and liabilities. Uh, we saw that play out in other crypto companies earlier this year. But the other aspect here, it does look like there was some improper 
activity commingling of investor funds. So not only you have leverage, but you are using investor funds um, for for other means, which is really where things get dangerous. Um, and then that's where I think um, you know this. You know, I heard the, the comment of you know having aspects of Enron. You know, that's what this is starting to look like a little bit more to us than even what we saw you know, 12, 15 years ago with the financial crisis. Can billions of dollars of paper valuation disappear without creating any real turbulence in other types of firms, whether it's Coinbase, whether it's other crypto assets, or are we really seeing the brunt of the fallout already? Yeah, it's hard to say you know, where the contagion is, but um, I think it's pretty obvious there's going to be more pain here. Uh, you know, there's clearly real losses happening throughout the system. Um, some of that's already kind of playing out and you have firms like BlockFi, BlockFi and Voyager that now kind of their futures are up in the air and they have um, assets and investor money. And so, um, you know, I, my, my sense is that there's more to come here. That's normally what happens um, in these types of crises. Um, that being said, you know, you go back to which firms have the best balance sheets um, and, and who can weather the storm. And that's where we do look at Coinbase and they've got $6 billion nearly of liquid assets and they do have customers assets matched one for one. And so, you know, the similar type of bank run um, we don't see happening there, but I, but I do think there could be more pain here before we get more clarity because we just don't know all the all the tentacles here of where FTX goes and you know, the contagion effects of that yet. We've been talking about the structural changes of adapting to higher interest rates after a period of low interest rates. And I wonder whether there's some sort of reputational risk, some extra premium that you have to build into what investors demand from some of these companies going forward. Do you think that there is a devaluation inherent in the entire crypto asset space as a result of this failure simply because people realize a risk that did not seem as severe Year, perhaps just days ago. Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, people that allocate capital are going to have to think about um, the risk reward in allocating that capital, and so they will need to be paid more for the risk they're taking. So, absolutely, that will affect you know, how people invest into the space. It's also going to probably affect, uh, in the near term, the amount of capital that comes into the space. Um, that being said, you know, I think the, the thing that gets missed here, in my opinion, in the conversation is. Um, you know, the blockchain technology and, and where that can actually drive real world application and util utility. And so um, was there maybe over enthusiasm and too much capital chasing um, opportunities that, you know, in the space really didn't make sense. You have 10 to 20,000 cryptocurrencies. Our view is that maybe a few percent of those actually have real long term value, but the ones that do um, could be very valuable. So I, I don't think this destroys the industry because I think the industry is built on um, a backbone of actually there being some good players that are trying to build something with real utility. And that, that's the key point here. But no doubt in the near term, this is a, a big stain on the industry. It will affect how much capital comes in. And we don't really know yet kind of where the contagion is, which is why we're looking at the strongest players. And a firm like Coinbase um, has a lot of capital here. And again, because they're regulated in the U.S. and are a uh, public company, you can see their financials very clearly. Hey, Devin, we've got a century's worth of history, more than that, for investment banking. So when something bad happens with something like MF Global, the industry survives. The question you're trying to answer, and I think it is the question right now, is whether this episode reveals something about bad actors or something about the whole asset class. Is there something about the immaturity of the whole asset class, and I use that word loosely perhaps, but the fact that we don't have decades and decades of history in this asset class where revealing something about bad actors also reveals something about the asset class? Um, perhaps, I, I think you, you hit the other term that I would use, immaturity um, and, and lack of kind of visibility and regulation. And so this is happening in uh, you know, traditional finance parties. You know, these are uh, things that happen in, in banks and in other institutions that are traditional finance as well that are poorly run uh, or take on too much risk. Um, you know, crypto, no doubt, has uh, you know, a, a part of the industry that I would argue is um, you know, there's a lot of scams, there is fraud, and you know, there isn't really a regulatory framework that's been laid out yet, which is why you know, in the US there's a lot of uncertainty, but even more so outside the US where really a lot of this happened. And so you know, I think that, that tells us that you know, if this is going to be an industry that's serious uh, and has a future, there needs to be a lot more clarity around the regulation and the rules of the road. And that will take out, I think, a lot of the excess, a lot of the bad actors, and allow what are, I think, a lot of really good and smart people that are building um, projects that have real utility to, to do well and actually bring in the capital they deserve. So um, we are in an immature uh, phase of the market right now. Uh, this looks really bad, but this is also 
again, these are uh, things that happen in kind of traditional finance. It's not just a crypto uh, issue here. So I just think that that needs to be made clear as well. Devin, appreciate your time. This is going to be a much longer conversation in the future, no doubt. Devin Ryan there of JMP Securities. I'm not going to make forecast predictions about what happens with this asset class. I think greed is a powerful thing. And if it starts going up again, you're going to see a lot of people take interest in it once more. In the near term, though, if you've got institutional money and you're the decision maker to take that risk, it's no longer just about risk reward. It's about reputation. And if you're the CIO, if you're running a pension fund, how do you justify putting money into this asset class right now? Because right now that is monster career risk. There is a broader point here, and I think you nailed it when you said greed is a powerful thing. Fear is overtaking greed. And a lot of these fissures are causing people to perhaps reassess how much they want to take that risk and what they will demand for it in terms of valuation. Just getting confirmation across the Bloomberg, the reports from the United States, the biden she meeting has ended in Bali after more than three hours. We'll talk about that in just a moment. From New York, this is Bloomberg. These markets and the way that they move, you can tell that there's this position cleansing in the market. I think there's a lot of FOMO in the market right now. Sure, we should get lower volatility, but I think we need to see the Fed plateau at least before that's going to happen. I would expect that they would still be looking at some of what is going on in markets with a little bit of trepidation. Right now, through the end of the year, it's probably okay. okay. I worry a little bit about getting into next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Got no idea where Monday came from. I think we're all still exhausted by last week. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio worldwide. Alongside Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Jerome Schneider of PIMCO coming up very, very shortly. TK out of the building for the next couple of days. We've got to start in Bali ahead of the G20 on the sidelines of that. President Xi, President Biden wrapping up a three-hour meeting. We're led to believe that in about 29 minutes we'll hear from the President of the United States, scheduled to speak at 8.30 Eastern time. So I guess we're going to find out what happened over three hours. Yeah. Are we going to get anything substantive, though? And what could that actually be? Because there is a hardening line that you're feeling around the world toward China. And it's kind of convenient to do so, given that the economy has deteriorated so much. So you are starting to see companies pull back. What can there be said about some sort of softening? What the increase in competition, but not necessarily animosity between these two nations? Do you think they said take a deep breath calm down that was governor waller yesterday everybody should just take a deep breath calm down we have a ways to go yet the official comment from the federal reserve coming into this week's trading perhaps he didn't like the fact that the markets rallied the most over two days going back to 2008 or something i mean if you take a look at some of the tech stuff the stats are nuts i mean they're incredible uh, in terms of the rallies how much are they concerned that you get to an undoing of all of the financial tightening that then sets them back even further again this raises a question of at what point does their jawboning lack potency for markets? Because we are not seeing a full retracement of what we saw over the last two trading sessions of last week. Are you suggesting that started this morning? I'm suggesting that, in general, the more that the Fed tries to target a, a level on the S&P, the more the market's going to push back on that and read what they want to into the inflation data and say, you guys are not going to have to move the way you're going to have to move. We're going to go ahead of that, and we're going to bet on that, not necessarily your rhetoric. I'm suggesting things can change very quickly. December 2nd of the payrolls report, December 13th for CPI, then December 14th for a Federal Reserve meeting. I think the 13th can change everything all over again. We're waiting for the outlooks for 2023. More concerned. Stanley had the confidence, the guts, to say, let's press send and just get it out there for 23, and they've done that. And here are some of the calls from them. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley, 3,900, year-end next year. Now, you might be thinking, are you talking about year-end this year? Because basically we're at 3,900 right now. 3,900 year-end next year. So basically from here to there, flat market, not quite. From point to point, yes, but in between, a volatile path to 3,900 is the call from Mike Wilson and the team. At Morgan Stanley. The conversations that we've been having this morning and that that outlook to me really highlights how much more you have to bake in a risk premium for everything that potentially is so volatile. Just because the volatility itself has an impact on people's investing ability, which is a reason why you see the Morgan Stanleys of the world going into high rated credit, high rated government bonds. You can get yield. And how do you protect yourself from this incredible volatility that really depreciates other assets that have gotten baked up over these years of low Jerome's rates? Jerome's sitting there thinking, stop stealing my lines. I need something to say in a few minutes. <laughs> the price action looks like this on the S&P 500. Futures still negative by about a third of 1%. To Lisa's point, we've had the Fed pushback. 
This is what it looks like in the market. You can barely see it. We're down a third of 1% on the S&P. You can see it in the bond market. Yields up across the curve. Twos out to 30s. On 10s, we're up eight basis points to 389.30. In the FX market, a little bit of dollar strength after some monster dollar weakness last week. Euro dollar 103.19. We're down a third of 1%. Jerome, you've been patient. Thanks for being patient. Let's start here. Do we need to take a deep breath and calm down? In the words of Governor Waller. Well, uh, absolutely. Governor Waller really, what he, what his statement really does is ultimately highlights that the debate is still ongoing at the Federal Reserve. And ultimately, as a market participant and as market participants in general, we have to recognize the fact that financial conditions will continue to evolve. And whatever that means to as a monetary policy implementer or as a risk taker of retail or institutional elk, it really just means that we're going to have to find ways to absorb the volatility in your respective portfolios. And yield is one way of doing that, quite honestly. And so the outlook becomes increasingly clouded as we sort of get data points. We all recognize that inflation is going to continue to evolve and perhaps ebb ever so slightly. And at PEMCO, we think it's probably moved slightly lower to about 3.7% CPI at the end of 2023. But this is continuing to be an evolutionary process. And to simply think that you are at a point where the the precise precision for being you know, at, the, at this point in the market is the end of the market is effectively pulling the river card and drawing an inside straight, which we haven't actually done at this point in time. Well, what do you make just in general of the volatility? I mean, we heard Priya Misra talking about 30 basis points of a move, and she said that's just kind of nuts, but it tells you everything you need to know about the environment that we're in. If people are trading so violently off of one print and aren't necessarily retracing it that much by take a deep breath and calm down from Chris Waller, does it tell you more about what power the Fed's words have, or does it tell you more about the lack of liquidity and the push-pull that's going on in markets? All the above, Lisa. And I think that's part of it is you have to think about market liquidity within the context which has been setting for our table. Uh, we've highlighted here before that the cost of capital changing is a fundamental uh, is a fundamental, fundamental impetus for the, mol uh, the volatility we're seeing in the marketplace, meaning higher cost of capital means higher hurdle rates, which means risk taking has to get paid more to be profitable. And ultimately, for investors, that hasn't been rationalized fully yet. So we're going to see uh, systematic recalibrations of risk taking as we go through this process, not systemic, but systematic. And so from that perspective, we have to be rational in terms of how financial conditions can evolve, how eventually we can get to a, p a point that the Federal Reserve will perhaps entertain you know, supporting growth instead of inflation. But that seems to be a little bit premature at this point in time. You said that this could create idiosyncratic pinch points of pain for investors, a systematic issue yeah. with liquidity. What are those points of pain? Well, I think you can already see it, and I hate to point to the crypto markets, but sometimes those immature markets can sort of lead to other things. I think more importantly, when you look at how the market has continued to evolve, the Points of indigestion are ones where there's not depth of conviction in terms of risk taking. Simply put, if you look at the, how the liquidity even within treasury markets is, it isn't as deep as it once it was. And we can see the susceptibility in the 30 basis point moves from last week. That doesn't necessarily ring positively in terms of the depth of the market liquidity. It just means that the clearing price for liquidity is higher than people should expect. So higher cash balances, being more defensive, and really running portfolios that have longer holding periods are all the same element of thinking about portfolio construction in this environment of uncertainty. Have you ever been this busy? We've been really busy. Um, and I'm I think sure it's I think it's the confluence of rates, the discussion of risk taking, thinking about how to restructure portfolios for, for errors that we haven't seen in 20 or 30 years, the discussion of not just necessarily terminal rates, but what it means to the overall economic environment. The intersection of all these factors is actually quite profound, not to mention the geopolitical risks that we're all trying to manage around at various points in time. I imagine as a team, the conversation at the moment, it's across various things, but here's one. Whether this is just a moment of time or whether this is something we have to live with for a number of years now, yeah. whether 3.5% to 5% on Fed funds is just this new world or maybe even the old world. Well, right, Jonathan. I think that one thing that we can count on is that higher front-end rates are here for some time. And that really goes to impact it. growth is going to remain sort of evolutionary. But more importantly, inflationary expectations may not be sub 2% in the immediate term. So the construct has inevitably changed to some extent. When we think about that from a portfolio construction, we think about them from a, a nominal yield as well as a real yield perspective, we have to put that in the context of what that means for all asset classes. So a more defensive posture, at least for the next year, is warranted. And you see that in some of the outlooks that have come out today. Even at PIMCO, we forecast a, a, a slight recession that's more prolonged in nature as we get 
into 2023. These are just factors that seem pretty rational given the lack of visibility on the go-for basis. But that doesn't necessarily mean that investors should sit there complacent to perhaps opportunities that present themselves and specifically actively positioning their portfolios around the various risks and opportunities that will evolve. And I think you can sort of see that as sort of looking through the glass and finding those opportunities has to require some patience along the way. When your outlook came out, I spoke to Tiffany Wilding about it. Mm -hmm. Of course, your colleague and good friend, she's great on this program too. That prolonged point, I think, is a key feature of your outlook that stands out from most. What is it that you see that makes you judge this downturn? It's going to be a little bit more prolonged than some people think. We all hear short and shallow. You're not saying short. You're saying prolonged. Why? Well, you, you look at it from, I think there's two elements to it. One is that the that the inflationary outlook will continue to probably be a little bit more prolonged. And granted, last week's data point sort of brings brings into focus like there's probably slightly more uh, velocity to the downside of it. But in reality, we're going to see certain factors and elements of inflation remain stickier for longer. And when you bake that in with the growth outlook, it probably pretends that there is a longer period of that lack of growth, of some, um, some turbulence within that uh, secular landscape. And from that perspective, when you look at the positive inertia, and I think that's sort of where we sometimes scratch our heads here, that requires differentiation in the terms of steering away from idiosyncratic risks that might potentially develop. So that's where, we were, that's where we're probably playing it more defensive side at PIMCO. It's hard to pick on consensus right now because I'm not sure what consensus is for 2023 because no one wants to press send on the outlook. But there is consensus around one thing, short and shallow. How many times have we heard short and shallow? That's not what you hear from the team at PIMCO at the moment. Not on the short side. And if you do get shallow and you get for long, does that have an even more pernicious effect than deep and short? And that's something that people have to reconsider. Huge risk factor for next year, recession and the Fed's not cutting. That's a brand new world. I think there's a huge difference between the end of hiking and the end of tightening. You can stop hiking interest rates, but if you get a recession and you're not cutting, I would still characterize that as tightening. You've got inflation rolling over and growth rolling over and you keep Fed funds at four and a half percent. Isn't that still tightening? It would feel like tightening to me, that's for sure. Have we seen basically a stealth transitory still baked into markets that basically sure. you're going to get that rate cut? You're going to get that return to what we had experienced in the past and perhaps other people saying, maybe not. The bias is deep. Still clinging onto Wall Street in a big way. I mean, that's the li that's been life for what? How many decades? I know, Jerome. This was awesome. It's good to see you. Good Isn't it nicer on the east coast? Waking up a little bit later <laughs> instead of on the west coast at yeah, three a. three a.m. starts. You know, it's it's fun. <laughs> Jerome Schneider of Pimco. Jerome, it's good to see you. Thank you. Live from New York. Coming up this hour, hopefully, the President of the United States in a scheduled news conference at 8:30 Eastern time after a three-hour meeting with China's President Xi from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Well, President Biden and China's Xi Jinping have wrapped up their first in-person meeting. It took place on the sidelines of the Group of 20 Summit in Bali, Indonesia. Well, since you assumed the presidency, we have maintained communication via video conferences, phone calls and letters. But none of them can really substitute for face-to-face -face exchanges. President Biden is expected to hold a press conference within the hour. We'll bring that to you live. OPEC has reduced its forecast for global oil demand again. That comes as the cartel implements production cutbacks designed to keep markets in balance. OPEC's latest report says weaker economic backdrop and China's strict anti-COVID measures are among the reasons demand is dropping. In Turkey, authorities say Kurdish militant group PKK and its U.S.-backed affiliates in Syria were behind a deadly bomb attack in Istanbul. The explosion killed at least six people, wounded 81 in the city's tourist district. Turkey says a suspect has been captured and identified her as a Syrian national. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos plans to give away a majority of his fortune during his lifetime. Bezos told CNN he will devote the money to fighting climate change and supporting people who can unify humanity. According to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, Bezos is worth $123.9 billion, making him the fourth richest person in the world. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
We do think this ultimately is a bear market rally, but once we get through the 200 day, that'll probably get the animal spirits going even more. That'll draw in more, you know, kind of uh, uh, passive flows that, that track that type of data. And we could see an overshoot, you know? I mean, I wouldn't rule it out. I'm something like 4,200, 4,300. Mike Wilson there and Morgan Stanley. Fantastic to catch up with him this past Friday. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. Equities just a little bit softer, down two tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. On the S&P, the road ahead for Morgan Stanley and Mike Wilson, 3,900 year end next year. That's the base case. We'll dig into that a little bit later. Rounding things up in Bali ahead of the G20 on the sidelines, we've just had a three hour meeting between President Xi and President Biden. We're getting a readout from the US side. So let me bring you the US side and I imagine we'll get the China side of things a little bit later this morning as well. Lisa, the two leaders spoke candidly about their perspective priorities and intentions across a range of issues. President Biden explained that the United States will continue to compete vigorously with the PRC, including by investing in sources of strength at home and aligning efforts with allies and partners around the world. So basically exactly what they said leading up to this. They want competition, but they don't necessarily want any conflict, basically reiterating that message. Also talking about climate change and macroeconomic stability, which is interesting given uh, that there has been some pushback. How does this play into a world where suddenly fossil fuels are reprioritized? On the more delicate topics, because that's one maybe they can agree on, President Biden raised concerns about PRC practices in Xinjiang, Tibet and Hong Kong and human rights more broadly on Taiwan. He laid out in detail that our one China policy has not changed. The United States opposes any unilateral changes to the status quo by either side. And the world has an interest in the maintenance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. We're going to build on this a little bit later. I'm keeping Guy Johnson waiting, who has a fantastic guest. So I'm going to jump over to Guy. And when we come back, I'll go through all of this on a second read. Guy, good morning to you, buddy. Good morning, John. Um, actually, in some ways, this is a related subject. Um, I'm here in Berlin with the CEO of Airbus, Guillaume Faurie, who is also the president of GIFAS, which is the French Aerospace Association. He's basically here for a meet and greet between the German and the French uh, aerospace communities. And I have to say, talking to people outside, listening to, to him speaking, there is a question that is being asked about France and Germany and whether or not they're on the same page, whether or not they are getting along. And I'm hearing this question being asked in a number of different places, and I think this is going to tie in as well to the question of China. So good morning, good, good afternoon. Good morning in the States, good afternoon here in Berlin. Let's talk about it, Guillaume. Let's talk about are France and Germany on the same page? Because sometimes at the moment, it doesn't feel like it. In Europe, we are faced with many challenges. Um, be it on the energy side, on defense, and, and others who have uh, large um, uh, dimensions. And obviously, France and Germany come from different places, and they have different priorities, and the stakes are not the same. So um, we are at a moment where it's not easy to find a way forward together, but it's never been so important to find those solutions together. So that's one of the reasons we're here. Uh, we have a lot of cooperation in Europe that involves German uh, projects, Germany, the German industry, and the French side as well. Uh, most of them are very successful. Um, new ones are being prepared, are, are being recently engaged, yeah. and we want to make this successful. The way to have Germany and France cooperating is having common projects, is having common programs, is having joint stakes together, and that's what we are in charge of. So this visit here in uh, Berlin today is in that frame, is against that backdrop of a lot of challenges in Europe, but, but at the defining moment, we're finding solutions together in Europe is probably more important than ever. What about on the subject of China? John was just bringing us the headlines from the meeting between President Biden and President Xi. I'm not going to ask you to comment on those. But we have just also had a trip by the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz to Germany, uh, to, to, to China, um, taking a number of, of German industrial leaders with him. He's trying to be constructive when it comes to China. Many in Europe, again, are questioning that. Where do you stand? Airbus got some big orders out of that trip. Where does Airbus stand on, on this relationship with China? We're working very closely with China on different fronts when it comes to commercial aviation and civil helicopters. We're not involved in defense, obviously. Uh, but on the civil aviation side, we have a long-lasting and very successful cooperation. We are buying from China. We are manufacturing in China. We have a final assembly line for the uh, very successful a320 family uh, in Tianjin, and we are also serving the market 
Uh, we have in China a market share that is roughly 20%, and we want to keep, sorry, 50%. So 50%, no, I mean, the, the Chinese market is 20% of the world, yeah. and we have a market share of 50% in China. Uh, we want to keep this position, this uh, commercial position, but we're not naive. We see the way the world is evolving and the challenges of making business between uh, China, uh, the West, Europe, and the US. Um, the way we're looking at it uh, is the following. Um, we've, it took 50 years to build the uh, high level of interdependency that we have today between the Chinese and the Western economies. This will not be changed overnight. And I'm not even sure we would want to change that very deep cooperation we have on the industrial side. But we need to make sure we are less exposed to risk of a geopolitical nature because we see the way the tensions are rising. So that's the way we're trying to navigate, but we do it uh, trying to uh, speak openly with our Chinese partners, with our Chinese customers, which are still in a very different uh, situation on the COVID side, still very much impacted by COVID, uh, and looking forward into a future where Airbus for civil aviation and helicopters will continue to play a big role serving the Chinese industry. Let's try and make a bit of news here. Um, you have a 700 delivery target by year end. You are going to have to go some to make that target. You, you've climbed mountains in November and December before. Mm -hmm. Are you going to do it this time? Is the risk that this year you're not going to make that number? How, how are you seeing things at the moment? How confident are you that you can make that 700? Mm -hmm. Well, we've maintained the guidance um, of 700 a couple of weeks ago when we announced our third quarter results because we think we can get there. Uh, it's indeed a, an interesting challenge. Uh, we are working against the backdrop of a very difficult environment, industrial environment. The supply chains are really challenged by all the uh, disruptions we see around us. But yes, we are working against that goal. And I hope we want to be able to do the same as what we did in 18 and 19 before COVID, having a lot of deliveries in the last two months of the year, obviously um, having the, uh, the hope that we will reach this uh, 700 marks. The guidance is around 700. That's what we're targeting. Around 700. Guillaume Fauré, uh, the CEO of Airbus and the president of GIFAS, thank you very much indeed. John, interesting to hear what Guillaume had to say about his position, his approach, his tactics, his strategy when it comes to China. Hey, Guy, fantastic work as always, sir. Guy Johnson there of Bloomberg, good friend of mine, good friend of this program, of course, as well. We keep talking about what a difficult environment it is for a market strategist. What a difficult environment for a corporate executive right now. Looking ahead, not just one year, but decades in some places, and that's tough. Especially for an airline industry that has been completely transformed by what we saw during the pandemic and now with certain geopolitical challenges. I mean, and also just the parts, every aspect of it, sure. it seems like it intersects behind their wings. We've been tracking the meeting with President Biden and President Xi in Bali ahead of the G20. It lasted three hours, just wrapped up. We've had the readout from the US side. I'll bring you some headlines of that in just a moment. And then shortly, we should hear from the President of the United States himself, scheduled to speak in about four minutes' time. We'll see about that. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Three-hour meeting between President Biden and President Xi just wrapping up in Bali. We're going to hear from the President of the United States imminently, the room filling out of the Grand Hyatt in Bali. Looking forward to hearing from the President. Moments ago, we had a readout from the White House on what the two leaders spoke about. I have to say the bulk of the tension is around the global issues, and that comes near the end of the readout. I'm going to read you a big bulk, a big chunk of this readout from the White House, and then hopefully we get the China side of things a little bit later as well. President Biden raised concerns about PRC practices in Xinjiang, Tibet, in Hong Kong and human rights more broadly. On Taiwan, he laid out in detail that our one-China policy has not changed. The United States opposes any unilateral changes to the status quo by either side, and the world has an interest in the maintenance, peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. He went on to say after that, he raised U.S. objections to the PRC's coercive and increasingly aggressive actions towards Taiwan, which undermined peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and in the broader region as well, and it jeopardizes, Lisa, global prosperity. President Biden also raised ongoing concerns about China's non-market economic practices, and it goes on and on and on. And then ultimately, towards the end, he talks about Russia a little bit, the risk of nuclear war, and ultimately the two leaders exchange views 
On that, President Biden raised Russia's brutal war against Ukraine and Russia's irresponsible threats of nuclear use. President Biden and President Xi reiterated their agreement that a nuclear war should never be fought. If you're thinking about how we build on this and move forward, the two leaders agreed that Secretary of State Blinken will visit China, Lisa, to follow up on these discussions. There's a real tension underpinning these comments. In other words, is it possible to have no physical conflict, no real issue that really percolates into something that risks uh, global peace, as, as uh, President Biden was saying, and also pull back from practices that he calls, that Biden calls non-market economic practices that hurt American families? In other words, taking business out of China. Is there an inconsistency to this goal that's going to really get exposed by perhaps the Chinese side in terms of how they respond? Well, whose rules are we going to play by? Is China going to play by the rules that the United States would like China to play by? Or is the United States going to start playing by the rules that China's been playing by for a long, long time? If you can't get market access in China, should Chinese firms have the same access to the United States? Can you withdraw from China? If you're a U.S. business, can you have some sort of policy to cause businesses to withdraw from China without it percolating into a broader conflict? I think that's the question, right? What is the consequence to the U.S. saying, we're not going to follow your rules, and China saying, well, we're not going to follow your rules either? And who do you decide to support most? Can you sit on the fence if you're the Europeans right now, if you're Germany? if you're the Netherlands, for that matter, if you're Japan. And there's tension between those countries on either side. For that matter, if you're Apple, right? For that matter, if you're some of the big corporations that do business in China. We did hear from Olaf Scholz today taking the side of the U.S. apparently, encouraging their businesses to pull back from certain pivotal industries, at least when it comes to doing business with China. When that news conference begins, I'll bring it to you. Before we get there, I want to whip through some of the price action and just give you a feel, a flavor of where we stand this Monday morning going into the trading week. We're down a little bit by a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. Soft and negative down by 10 basis points lower on the S&P. As where bond yields higher, Governor Waller pushing back a little bit earlier overnight in Australia, up eight basis points on a 10-year, 389.30. Bit of dollar strength out there as well, but wow, some monster dollar weakness last week. Euro dollar 103.18 and crude 87.88. We're down a little more than 1%. Diane Swank, chief economist at KPMG and charged with following some of the Fed speak. Dan, can we start with Governor Waller yesterday evening in Australia? What did you make of his latest comments and the pushback seemingly against the market action? I think we're going to see more of it. I think what you see with the Fed is, you know, they've agreed to do more measured rate hikes, but they're, as they close in on a terminal rate, but they still think that terminal rate, the peak in short-term rates, is higher than they did just a few months ago. And they're going to stick to that kind of language for some time. I think we're going to also see, when we see the PCE index, because of that weird medical cost deceleration in the CPI, the PCE index, which is a day before the Fed meets in December, that when that's released, it's going to show a little hotter core CPI, and the Fed's going to feel pretty justified about continuing to raise rates, although at a 50 basis point pace instead of a 75 basis point pace. And the Fed also doesn't like to see financial market conditions easing right now when they're still trying to tighten. I know that sounds strange, but the bottom line is this is undoing much of the forward guidance that the Fed has worked so hard to establish. Feels like that summer rally on repeat, and I think Governor Waller alluded to the problems that come about from that. We put some numbers just on the SCP that might come out in the middle of December. In fact, it will come out in the middle of December. Can we put some numbers on that, Diane? We saw the SCP and the dot for 2023 move from 380 to 460. I thought that was a major jump. It was a big jump. Are you expecting something similar, something similar in the December meeting, 460 and to what? Well, we did have six participants at that meeting that had 5% as the high end of that um, that range. And so I would expect to see those six participants to move above 5%. And we could see that SEP, the high end of that rate, move slightly above 5% as well. Our expectation now is that the high end of the range is five and a quarter percent, which is 5.125 in the middle of the target range. But I think that's important to remember is that we already had six participants at the meeting in September looking to go higher than what the SEP was telling us. Diane, you mentioned the medical costs, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but there was a glitch or a strange uh, confluence of numbers in the latest CPI report. If you back out that health care component, what does CPI look like? Well, the CPI, certainly the underlying inflation members, numbers look like they're beginning to peak, which is the good news. And I'm actually much more optimistic that we're going to see 
a disorderly or a welcome sort of deceleration in shelter costs as we get into 2023 much more quickly than the Federal Reserve expects. That said, this is still a number that's too hot for the Fed and not low enough for the Fed to feel like, you know, the war is over. And I think that's very important that the Fed still feels like they still have to go higher on rates to cool inflation. And it's still too hot of an inflation rate for them to stop thinking about the pain that might accompany it, which is a rise in the unemployment rate. We were just talking with Jerome Schneider of PIMCO about how this feels like it could be a prolonged downturn. Even if it's shallow, it's going to last a long time. Do you adhere to that kind of view that perhaps the worst case scenario of a severe downturn seems taken off the table a little bit more, but that it could be a very long time before we see meaningful growth at levels that we'd seen over the past decade? I think it's going to be, a, you know, every recession is different. Our own expectations are for a moderate recession of a couple of quarters without a robust rebound in the second half of 2023 and then really gaining momentum in the end of 2024. So as a prolonged period of weakness, that is what we are seeing. That said, we're only talking about a high in the unemployment rate nipping close to 6%. That is really low for an unemployment rate for a recession. There's a lot of reasons for that, none the least of which is the aging of the population and the loss of participation by those over 65. Those are going to be holding the participation rate down and the overall unemployment rate down. But this is a very different kind of recession, disproportionately hitting housing, some spillover into consumer spending. Business investment will be hit, but unevenly. We've got the ramp up of electric, via electric battery pants going on. We've got subsidies for chip plants going on. Those are ramping up much more quickly than the infrastructure spending bill, which was passed sooner. And that's not going to hit until we get into well into 2024 and 2025. And just out of interest, if the Democrats hold on to the House... And they may well do. I've got no idea what happens here. Everyone's still talking about gridlock. But ultimately, things have shifted the other way more recently. Would that change your outlook at all? I think the biggest change in the outlook is the risks of, you know, battle over the debt ceiling and what that would mean at a time when the Fed's still raising rates. You know, we already had the debacle of 2011 and the debt ceiling debate back then. To take that off the table, I think, is good news. Now, whether or not it means more stimulus or more stimulus if we hit a downturn, I still think that we're limited in fiscal space. So I'm not sure that it actually means more stimulus out there. It certainly... I don't think they're going to have an easy path to any kind of changes in policy, which is a bit unfortunate because we need to make some major decisions on policy that I believe need to be bipartisan in scope. And I don't see that no matter what the outcome is either way. Diane, fantastic as always to catch up with you. Diane Swank there of KPMG. I talked about the readout from the White House on the meeting between Xi and Biden, getting somewhat of a readout from the China side of things. The Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Foreign Ministry spokesperson out on Twitter writing the following. The two sides should respect each other, coexist in peace, pursue win-win cooperation and work together to ensure that China-US relations move forward on the right course without losing direction or speed, still less having a collision. She goes on to say that China does not seek to change the existing international order or interfere in the internal affairs of the United States and has no intention to challenge or displace the U.S. At least these comments go on and on and on, but here's another line for you. China-U.S. interaction should be defined by dialogue and win-win cooperation, not confrontation and zero-sum competition. It all sounds really collegiate and kumbaya. There is a question of how much the uh, the interests of both of these nations can really come into some sort of cohesiveness at a time when you have seen a real pulling back. And there really is a lack of clarity around what China's policies are, not only for zero COVID, but just in general for international business. President Xi pointed out that the world is at a major inflection point in history. Countries need to both tackle unprecedented challenges and seize unprecedented opportunities. This is the larger context in which we should handle and view China-US relations. You can see the picture on the screen if you're watching this on TV. If you're on radio, it is uh, almost President Biden time at the Grand Hyatt in Bali, expected to take place at 8.30 Eastern time, so about 10 or 11 minutes behind at the moment, Bramo. But a three-hour meeting at a news conference just around a corner. So what do they want to signal, right? And here's what I'm really wondering. How does President Biden view this and angle this as a win when it seems like from the readout they express a lot of the things that they've been talking about? Do we get any sense that they've come to any agreements 
not so much from these statements. Going to find out shortly, and we'll catch up with Anne-Marie Horden as well. In the next hour, I'll catch up with Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genmity, Katarina Simonetti of Morgan Stanley, and Evercore's Julian Emmanuel. Looking forward to all of that still to come in the next hour on Bloomberg TV. Equity futures down a quarter of 1%. The President of the United States from Bali, just around the corner. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden and China's Xi Jinping both called for reduced tensions between the world's two largest economies. The two met for about three hours today on the sidelines of the Group of 20 summit in Bali, Indonesia. As the leaders of uh, our two nations, we share responsibility, in my view, to show that China and the United States can manage our differences, prevent competition, from becoming anything ever near conflict and to find ways to work together on urgent global issues that require our mutual cooperation. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will visit China to follow up on the Biden G talks. In Ukraine, President Vladimir Zelensky visited the newly liberated city of Kherson. Zelensky spoke to troops there. Now, Kherson was the first major city occupied by Russia when it launched the invasion almost nine months ago. A Ukrainian counteroffensive forced Russian troops to withdraw. Fed Governor Christopher Waller says there's still a ways to go before the central bank stops raising interest rates. He told the conference in Sydney that the rates will stay high for a while until inflation gets down closer to the Fed's target. Policymakers could lower the size of the rate hikes to 50 basis points at next month's meeting. And a shooting at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville Sunday night left three people dead and two wounded. It took place at a parking garage on campus. Police are searching for who was described as armed and dangerous. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. a lot like um, you know what happened in the financial crisis with the big banks and leverage and mismatch of assets and liabilities. Uh, we saw that play out in other crypto companies earlier this year. But the other aspect here, it does look like there was some improper activity, commingling of investor funds. So not only you have leverage, mm -hmm. but you are using investor funds um, for, for other means, which is really where things get dangerous. That was Devin Ryan, Director of Financial Technology at Research at JMP Security, speaking with us earlier this morning as we parsed through the fallout of FTX, the collapse of a company that went from billions of dollars of market value to zero overnight. Right now, just taking a look at markets, you are seeing a bit of a retracement after the rally on Friday and Thursday. Although, I got to say, if you job owning was what Chris Waller, uh, the Federal Reserve governor, was trying to do, not necessarily uh, that big of a decline. If you take a look at yields, they are uh, they are climbing a little bit, but this ahead of a big discussion with Lil Brainerd and our very own uh, Peggy Collins later this morning. You can also see the dollar sort of reasserting a little bit of strength after a huge bout of weakening. Uh, uh, heading into the end of the week. I mean, in two days, the biggest two days of weekending going back to 2008. We want to parse out as we wait for comments from President Biden over in Bali after the readout from his meeting with Xi Jinping, parsing through some of the wreckage of the past couple of decades, you could argue, uh, in term, but uh, per per particularly over the past couple of years in terms of all of the money flooding into more speculative investments. Shanali Basik, Bloomberg Wall Street reporter, uh, joining us here. And I'm Curious, Shanali, from your perspective, the FTX saga, how much that really represents something bigger that you're seeing happening throughout Wall Street when you speak to executives, where they're seeing, starting to see things wash out more completely. Certainly, you thought that a lot of the behavior when it came to venture capitalists flowing money into firms that they don't take board seats on and they don't see the balance sheet of, you would think that that kind of behavior would be ending the last couple of years after we've seen some major hiccups in the venture capital world. But clearly, that has not been the case. Crypto has not operated as a standalone 
industry, away from the traditional capital markets. Remember, Ontario teachers, Tomasic, were among the types of investors that were invested in a firm, in this firm, let alone a firm like this. And there's a question of how much this is really just an outcome of negative yields for so long or zero rates. And there's a question of how much this is actually fraud. And Katanga Johnson, a Bloomberg Banking Regulation reporter, is there in the Bahamas. And uh, I'd love to get your take, Katanga, on how much of this really was fraud, was something uh, much more nefarious than just simply money that went after an investment that turned out to be bad. Morning. That's actually something that the Bahamas Securities Commission and the police are investigating, the Financial Crimes Division here in the Bahamas, mostly because they've not yet made a determination about whether uh, there was crime or their probes aren't necessarily concluded yet. We learned yesterday uh, that Sam bankman fried and others uh, are being probed by the regulator and the police. But before any determination is made, uh, they have to complete their investigation and then they'll make a recommendation to uh, the Office of the Public Prosecutor, uh, who will then determine whether whether there was actually indeed crime. Katanga Johnson, thank you so much. Uh, reporting for us down in the Bahamas, Shanali, to your point earlier about some of the institutional money that has gone into crypto assets, how much of a rethink, how much have we already seen some of the losses actually taken down versus yet to be realized, as well as the selling that will have to occur to meet certain margins, et cetera? I think we have to see the extent of the contagion here, because some of the things are tied to FTX, the hundreds of firms that they were invested in that were also tied to other investors or the companies that simply had their brokerage accounts with FTX that now won't be able to get their money back and will face their own financial troubles potentially. Then we also have to think about the other companies that just from the broader industry damage are feeling the pain. Think about Crypto.com and the revelation of $400 million mistakenly sent through that network and the lack of confidence now in their token. So it's very unclear how widespread the contagion is. I think it's important to think about whether the FTX debacle would have been revealed if that contagion hadn't already started this year. And so is this uh, just the beginning of a story that's a much broader unraveling? And it's crypto, but it's also on a broader level. You're starting to see, uh, sort of as Brian Chesky said, the lights go on and at the nightclub and you see what is left at the party. Do we have a sense that there are other aspects of the banking industry that are starting to feel a bit more stress, perhaps less transparent, less liquid areas? Uh, if you think about the pension fund crisis, we saw, I think that's the example everyone keeps using, leverage that is hidden outside of the banking system. Ultimately, this impacts investors at the end of the day. Uh, banks have taken a lot of losses in the last couple of years. I don't know why. This is something that we're talking about now. There was Arkegos in the last couple of years. Uh, there were serious repo market issues in the last couple of years. Leverage has been an issue for years now. Yet, it's only now when we're seeing billions of dollars worth of customer funds at stake that people are waking up to pay attention to it. We were speaking with Devin Ryan, and he said that one of the biggest consequences of this isn't necessarily a banking collapse, right? That they are very well capitalized, at least the major banks. But there is an issue with respect to how much consumer credit they can extend, how much credit they can extend to businesses if they are constrained in terms of losses, in terms of failed efforts to have trading desks devoted to crypto and trading desks devoted to other assets that are proven to be difficult. How much have you started to see that already? What's hard about watching banks take hundreds of millions of dollars in losses tied to leverage loans or other issues is the point you're making. Every dollar that is tied up or lost in a risky bet tied to a corporation or a fund in this instance that is not using it productively is a dollar that's not going into the American economy. It's not going into a large corporation that may need it at a time of stress. I think we're only starting to see the beginning. You, have, you heard Mike Wilson just on Friday say that the crypto contagion is a direct result of tighter financial conditions. It's something we have not seen in many, many years. I'm going to put you on the spot, Chanel, because sure. I know you speak to a lot of uh, senior executives across Wall Street and all different walks of the business. How much are you starting to hear about private equity and private debt? I did a panel just a couple of days ago down in Miami with two private equity executives and one liquid market investor, public market investor. And the public market investor said, why are we paying you guys when we have not seen the markdowns yet. 
I think that that's a tough question because so long as the public marks don't keep going down, they're able to mark down lightly and they're able to stave off the pain from that for as long as the markets stay relatively safe. We don't know yet how deep those markdowns get. And is there going to be a bigger demand to mark those market uh, mark those marks closer to what the public markets look like? Open question. Okay, so in your conversations, just quickly, because I want to put you on the spot even more, do you have a sense of how big those write-downs could potentially be, given how much we've seen public markets sell off relative to what's been going on in the private markets? If you take a look at what's happened already here, you have seen marks that are kind of in the low single digits. It's not, not nothing too crazy, at least for the biggest firms. Where they're seeing markups is in direct lending, in private credit. I think that that's a direct response to showing you that things may not be so good and you can charge a little more when it comes to taking on more credit today. I think that that's the story that's being shown in the numbers of all the firms that you're looking at. Shanali Basik, thank you so much. A really pivotal moment and a really important conversation to be having when people are looking for another shoe to be dropping. At some point, uh, looking towards some of the less traded assets, perhaps, that have yet to be fully repriced. We are waiting for President Biden to begin his press conference. It was supposed to start at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. It has yet to start, but we have our seen people assembling there. Anne-Marie Hordern has been in Bali covering all of the proceedings. We get, did get a readout from the uh, U.S. side as well as the Chinese side. It seems like the one agreement is nobody wants war, but perhaps that's where the agreements end. Anne-Marie, is there any crossover in terms of the readouts that really is a newsworthy and an important thing to take uh, to take note of? I think one of the most important parts of the White House readout is that the leaders say they agreed to Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken visiting China to call up their discussions. This really shows that this was a frank and candid discussion, but that day will continue. So this looks like it is the follow-up to this meeting that they want to maintain these relationships uh, between Washington and Beijing. We should note, um, as we wait for the president to arrive, his staff uh, many members of his staff just walked in, so potentially that press conference may be underway soon. It is slightly delayed, but we do know that the president and Xi Jinping spoke for about three hours. They describe it as a candid conversation. A number of topics were discussed, as we've been talking about all week, climate change, debt sustainability, health security. Most importantly as well, the president raised concerns about China's practices about human rights broadly, but also what's going on in Xinjiang, and then, of course, Taiwan. This would be the most critical for China. And the president in this readout says they maintain that the U.S. policy has not changed. Who do you think, Anne-Marie, based on your conversations with senior officials there, has the upper hand in terms of leverage heading into this at a time when the U.S. wants to see perhaps a bit more decoupling with China and certain key industries, as well as Germany, at least that's what Olaf Schultz was saying. But on China's side, you do have that they are still the factory to the world, despite many companies making noise about onshoring or nearshoring. Yeah, companies are making noise about onshoring, nearshoring. What the United States is doing, though, is also a big concern for some U.S. allies in Asia as well as in Europe. Two things that come to mind specifically. One, obviously, the sweeping curbs on semiconductor technology. This is technology that China will need if it wants to advance its military. And the Biden administration hasn't gotten the full go-ahead from their allies on this. It's something China calls U.S. hegemony. And then, of course, this has nothing to do with the Xi Jinping meeting, but in Europe, there's a big concern and growing dissatisfaction with the Biden administration when it comes to the um, Inflation Reduction Act and what that means for subsidies for U.S. companies. And I spoke to Ursula von der Leyen here at the G20, and she said they are working on trying to have a working group to map this out. So these are the type of issues that the U.S. is trying to gain an upper hand on China, but definitely looking more so uh, domestically, as well as, we should note, Lisa, on the sidelines of the G20, as well as the president in Cambodia, as with the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, they are trying to diversify supply chains. And something you hear from countries is that what they learned from Russia, especially the Europeans, is that you cannot be reliant on just one country for one commodity or acute 
supply chain consumer good because that clearly does not work. And we heard that from Olaf Scholz talking about essential industries that they want to see German businesses really move away from China uh, with respect to. And Marie, is there anything that we are going to learn today that could give some sort of insight into the muscle that the U.S. or even Germany, but particularly the U.S. is going to put behind that message because they can say that, but companies are going in the opposite direction? Well, we'll have to see what the president says. What they continue to do, though, is embark on things like sweeping of the curbs. If you're a U.S. company and there's U.S. technology in your ship, you cannot send it to China. And the big issue right now for the likes of Germany, which their powerhouse and growth of uh, economy is reliant on China, and if or ASML in the Netherlands, if you are a company that has an ounce of U.S. technology in your chip, Washington has pretty much signaled you cannot be selling that to China. So these companies are in the crosshairs. And that was probably part of the discussion, because this is something that has clearly uh, irked China. Uh, we should also note, Lisa, another big part of this discussion, which you haven't gotten to yet, and it talks about in, in the communique, is what is going on with North Korea. And I mention that because on the heels of this meeting, the president sat down with the leaders of Japan and South Korea. And for them, this is one of the biggest concerns. And the message we were told he was going to relate to Xi Jinping was that either China reigns in North Korea or you can expect a bigger military presence in the region. Interesting. I'm wondering if that's really going to be the big takeaway. How does the United States signal that they're going to take a hard line on some of these uh, regions, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Taiwan, at a time when China has made the opposite noises? They want to uh, bring Taiwan under the fold of mainland China. How much does that really uh, create a conflict if the U.S. is going to start building up troops? I mean, is it building up a military presence in the region? Well, this has been China's biggest concern. And one of that has to do with the fact that the president, on at least four occasions, most recently in September, when he sat down with 60 Minutes and was asked, will the U.S. send military troops? And President Biden said if there was a, quote, unprecedented attack. The answer was yes. This is something the president was not willing to do with Ukraine, but it does look like he was willing to do with Taiwan. It was direct, and he was emphatic about it. The issue is the White House continuously walks back the president's comments on Taiwan. So one thing to watch out for when the president takes the stage, hopefully momentarily we see more of his staff filtering in uh, at the Grand Hyatt in Bali, is the fact is he going to sound more hawkish on Taiwan, which we saw him do in public addresses, in sit-down interviews, in a CNN town hall, all throughout the past year and a half. Or will he stick to the script of this readout, which the U.S. has not changed its policy? Great work. And Marie Ardern, thank you so much for that. We'll be looking for your insights after the press conference. We are awaiting that press conference, which should begin momentarily. It is about a half an hour late at this point. President Biden set to give remarks after his nearly three-hour meeting with Xi Jinping, talking about a host of issues having to do with Taiwan, having to do with North Korea, having to do with Russia, as well as trade, as well as uh, just making sure that the two nations do not lock horns in some sort of a more hot war type of scenario. Right now in markets, we are seeing a little bit of softness after last week's incredible rally. We did see a bit of a yields rising, a price down on bonds, trying to retrace some of what we saw again in the last two days of last week or Thursday for the bond market after Chris, uh, Chris Waller's uh, comments over the weekend talking about, take a deep breath, it's just one report. The CPI report shouldn't do that. We are going to give you some insight around the press conference from President Biden, the first meeting between the United States and China, the leaders of that nation in person since the coronavirus pandemic. From New York, this is Bloomberg Surveillance.